be awake. This episode of Shockwaves is brought to you by Mixtape Massacre, the board game for 80s horror fans. Mixtape Massacre is a tabletop board game where up to six players play as horror film archetypes and compete in a fictional 1986 killing spree to be remembered. Collect kill tokens as you roam the small town of Tall Oaks and stack up your body count or take each other out of the game in epic brawls. With tons of references to 1980s music, films, and pop culture, Mixtape Massacre will have you laughing while you're slashing. It's available now at mixtapemassacre.com. Want more? The Black Mask expansion arrives this spring, bringing in more gore slashers card and gameplay. Have you gotten your tickets for this year's Texas Frightmare Convention? The Shockwaves team will be there. Other amazing guests include Clive Barker and several of the famous Hellraiser Cenobite actors and actresses, Matthew Lillard, Stephen Weber, Tobin Bell, Ron Perlman, Kane Hodder, Brad Dourif, and many others. Tickets are on sale now, and you can pre-order discount passes. So don't wait. You do not want to miss this con. Visit www.texasfrightmareweekend.com, and we'll see you in Texas. Come touch us on our face. <laughs> Today's episode of Shockwaves is brought to you by Shudder. Brought to you by AMC Network, Shudder is not only a premium streaming video service, but an experience unlike any other. Created for fans of all degrees of thriller, suspense, and horror, Shudder is home to the largest and fastest growing human curated selection of high quality, spine tingling, and provocative films, TV series, and originals, and there's always something new and unexpected for Shudder members to explore. Premiering exclusively on Shudder this week is the film Don't Grow Up. And on an isolated island, a group of teenage delinquents living in a youth center wake up to find themselves alone with no one to watch over them. They realize the island has been deserted, or practically deserted. The few adults they encounter on their journey all seem to be infected by a mysterious epidemic making them violent and dangerous. Best described as Skins Meets 28 Days Later, Don't Grow Up is a tense story of oncoming adulthood reminiscent of John Carpenter. Sold. Shudder is available for $4.99 a month or $49.99 with an annual membership, but our listeners can get a free month by entering promo code SHOCK at checkout. Go to Shudder.com today and find the best collection of thrillers, suspense, and horror available to stream anywhere. Okay, and welcome to episode number 79 of Shockwaves. I'm one of your hosts, Rob Galuzzo. I'm sitting here with Mr. Elric Kane. Hey, buddy. Hey, man. Let's do it. 79. 79. 79. Man. I like wow. it. Before you know it, we'll be up to 100 again. Oh, which boy. Which is kind of crazy. Also with us, Rebecca McKendry. Hello, welcome. Hello, guys. Hi, how are you? Doing well. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, we do not have Ryan. He was going to Skype in our fourth host, Ryan Turek. Uh, he is busy. He's, he's making he's making a new Halloween production and stuff. So we do not want to distract him because we want the new Halloween to be good. Exactly. Uh, so uh, great for uh, great for him. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of work, uh, I hope you guys don't mind. I'd like to talk a little bit about what I'm up to, and uh-huh. it really does pertain to our listeners because uh, I got to tell you, they really helped me out um, when it came to uh, booking some theaters for what I'm planning. But back in September, I was hired by Epic Pictures to head up their new all horror label, Dread Central Presents. And the basic idea is that you know they've done films like Tales of Halloween and Turbo Kid, uh, Big Ass Spider, some great cult films, uh, but they also you know know do dramas and family films and things like that and so they had acquired the website dread central last year and figured well you know if we're going to keep making dramas and things like that all our horror stuff should be under label Mm -hmm. and they um for better or worse hired me to Mm -hmm. kind of uh shepherd the whole thing and um basically so that's what i've been working on the last several months and uh, I'm pretty excited because we've been I've been waiting until January to really kick it off. Like I wanted some time to really think about how we we're going to do this. And basically, uh, we've got about 12 titles locked. Uh, some some really, really exciting ones that we have talked about pretty extensively on the show. Uh, and um, in fact, I believe Monday morning uh, after you hear this, uh, there's one in particular, a Norwegian movie called uh, Vilmark Asylum that is debuting on Amazon Prime. Mm-hmm. So that's one that you'll be able to see right away. Um, and it's very cool. It's, it's basically a Norwegian version of like Session 9. It, it's same kind of premise. Uh, and then later this month, we start our theatrical run. And basically... 
you know, because I don't, because I'm not an exec and I've never done this job before, I, I guess I'm thinking a little differently of what I would like to see as a fan. And so I kind of heard how theatrical normally runs and it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know how any independent movie has any shot at, at making any money doing a theatrical run. You know, right. it's, it's just, you know, if you play in you know, for seven days in two theaters and you have to like, you know, buy all the seats in advance. And it's like, how, how does, welcome to the state of independent film in 2018. It's, well, it's That's terrible. That's called four walling and it's, exactly. it's so expensive and terrible. That is the term. It's called four walling. Mm. But here's the thing. I, I looked at that and I was like, well, okay, what's, what's a different way that we can go about this? Now we talk about this on the show all the time, which is the basic concept of us getting friends together and having a movie night. And so <laughs> through Dread Central, um, because I know we have specific people all over the country that write for us or that are just friends, uh, I, I kind of assigned a bunch of people to be ambassadors or moderators, for lack of a better term. And uh, I, I'm like, you know what? Let's just do monthly screenings, not you know seven times a week or whatever it is, one night only, like the last Thursday of the month. You get together with a bunch of like-minded people, see our movie before anybody else and that's it. And, you know, we'll give giveaways and things, you know, to kind of make it fun. Do you have a cool label name for it? The night? Uh, no, it's just Dredge Central Presents. Okay. Yeah. And so the first one is going to be uh, at the end of this month, January 25th and 26th. And it's a uh, zombieology. Enjoy yourself tonight, which is a pretty crazy Chinese zombie movie, mm -hmm. which I think was based on an anime. Uh, and it's in Mandarin, which is, uh, you know, slightly different. Mm -hmm. Oh no, it's Cantonese. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that one's really crazy. And, uh, for, you know, my bosses feared that maybe people might not want to go see a Chinese movie. So I paired it up with turbo kid, mm -hmm. which is what I would do. If friends are coming over and I'm like, well, let's watch this crazy movie. And then if you've never seen turbo kid on the mm -hmm. big screen, then let's watch them both together. And so, so that's our first one out of the gate, which is at the end of this month. And, um, I, you know, I'm just really excited about it. I, I, I want people to have an experience. And what's cool is the theaters we've booked are not like your AMC types. Uh, in fact, I'm wearing the shirt now. Film bar film rocks. Bar. Uh, and let me tell you, they were, I want, you know, cause my folks are in Arizona. Um, they are a bar that happens to have a screen in the back. Oh, cool. uh, and so when I went, um, they treated me really well. They were showing Miracle Mile that night, so I popped uh, in and watched a few minutes of that. Did you hang out with Monty? I did. Monty, who's one of our Arizona listeners, uh, met me there for a drink. I love Monty. Is that Monty Yezzy? Yeah. Yes. Oh, he's awesome. he's yeah. there. Yeah. And so he, he came and met with me along with the, uh, the owner of the bar. And I just had a great time. And that's the thing. I guess I didn't realize how many of these type of places there are that it's part bar mm -hmm. and theater or part cafe and theater. And to me, it's like I would just hang out here regardless. Yeah. And so those are the theaters we're going for. That's what I think is going to be a little bit different. And in terms of like the slate, because we have a lot of weird movies, we've announced that one, Zombieology. Um, we've got terrifier coming out uh which is uh kind of like an 80s slasher throwback with a killer clown uh, a lot of our our shockers have talked about that one and seen it at festivals for me there's a i've talked about it on the show a super art house sci-fi movie called imitation girl with lauren ashley carter uh, uh written I directed love lauren by lauren ashley carter she's great she's amazing it's the first film from this writer director named natasha kermani and i love her i as soon as i saw the movie i was just so mesmerized and it's so different than what you would associate with the name Dread Central. And I was like, well, that's what I want to do. You know, between that, Adam Rifkin's movie with Penn Jillette, it's just a bunch of weird shit across the board. And the idea is like, I'm not trying to knock any labels. Like, I love A24. They do great work. But I know what I'm going to get with them every time. Right. Which is going to be kind of the slow burn festival favorite. And the thing is, like, I love Golan and Globus movies. I love Roger Corman. I, nobody does that anymore. Yeah. And so I know it's a grand ambition, but if I can show you something that's going in Globus style, like every month, that's completely different from the last mm -hmm. thing, then maybe I can make a mark. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the idea behind the label and what we're doing. And, um, and again, thank you guys for letting me, uh, where will people talk find the touring it. schedule for that kind of thing? Like, would there be one centralized site that would have all the, dates um, and well, most of it. Yeah. On Facebook, I have a page that I created dread central presents, which is facebook.com slash dread central presents. And I've been posting most of the information there. Um, there's groups for each individual city. Um, and you could find articles periodically on Dread Central, but really the Facebook page is your best bet. And I've been trying to share it as much as possible on uh, the Shockwaves um, or Movie Club. Uh, because here's the thing. For this month, we've got 10 theaters. And right now I'm negotiating for 15 for February's movie. And so I hope to continue growing it and just make it something kind of cool. And 
again, I don't, I don't know anybody else that's doing this. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, it's a different approach. It's like, and, and the also, also, just so you know, when you play in AMC, I don't know if I'm allowed, I should be telling you this information, but Industry whatever. secrets. Industry secrets. Most major theaters like AMC or Regal or whatever, um, if you could play their theater, but they make you, they make you have a 90 day window, meaning you cannot release the movie, uh, for three months mm. after that in any other format. There's kind of these weird exclusivities. Yeah. There's a lot of weird rules. There's like a lot of weird rules. into playing at theaters. And my idea was like, well, I want the VOD within two weeks of the, of the, the Dread Central screening is your first chance to see it. And then when people talk about it, uh, you know, when can I see it? You know what? Next Friday. That, that's kind of the idea is, well, we want to keep it as close as possible because I, I want everybody to be able to see these movies. So Maybe you'll be able to play some of these movies at the new theater called The Fairfax because that news hit today. You Where? never know. The news uh, CineFamily. Where is it opening up no, in it, the – It is CineFamily. It, it is. It's just that spot. It's the it's same just original owners. They're just owners. rebranding, re rebooting. I think it's going to be quite different, um, the mantra, but obviously. But it is the original, the same owners. Have, yes. Are they bringing in a whole new staff and everything? They, or? There's some talk that it could be a couple of the same programmers. I mean this is just the initial article. We had heard a little bit behind the scenes, but this article popped up today and it just said it's going to be called the Fairfax. And yep. that's all there yeah, is, and so. there's a few – yeah, a few familiar faces, the, the good ones that yeah. were there. Yeah, exactly. Some other uh, programmers. May continue on there. Yeah, I would love to. Um, the irony is I, I haven't really locked in a Los Angeles location, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I would love to do these uh, shows here. Um, but, you know, uh, one thing at a time, and um, and we'll see how it goes. I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's a weird time to be an independent film, uh, as Becca can say. I know yeah. you're selling your movie, too, and it's tough. It's a trip. It is a trip. So, you know, again, that's my – I just want to be known as the guy that put out, like, Golan Globus-type movies. Hmm. But, <laughs> you know, awesome. I think that's uh, not a bad goal to have. <laughs> Uh, so anyways, that's that. Um, what have you guys done or seen this week? I watched some batshit crazy stuff. Oh, boy. So I'm going to jump brand. in here. On brand. Totally on brand. Um, so I'm going to start with 1988's Don't Panic. Has anyone else seen this? Has it got like martial arts on the cover? Kind of. No, like it's, not no. really. Okay, so we talked about this briefly um, when we had the guys from the draft house on. Um, also from Bleeding. Uh, Wait, what year is it again? 1988. Oh, 88. Mm-hmm. It's like a Freddy Krueger ripoff cover. Mm. Whoa, there's a, there's one from 78, which is also called uh, oh, oh, by Saints boy. Blood by the guy that did uh, Slugs and uh, Pieces. What? <laughs> and Wait, the Rift. I love this and guy. The and the Rift. Yeah, so. Why haven't I not seen this one? Picard, well, there's a Don't Picard. Panic from 78, so you have to look okay, that one up. Okay, Don't Panic okay, from 78. Right. I'll watch it Here by next Don't week. Panic 1987. 19, oh, oh, the, 1988. The, the, the like Freddy thing. Yeah, so this oh, is the this Freddy cover, thing. Yeah. We talked okay. about this when we did um, the Draft yep. House episode um, with the Bleeding Skull guys just yep. a couple of weeks back. Right. Um, and this is the one that they talked about, which is the Mexican Freddy Krueger ripoff. Which was booked at Cinefail. It was <laughs> booked, and that's why I watched it. So I actually, um, Josh Miller and Ryan were doing a screening of this, a midnight screening that's of right. this at Cinefamily now, yeah. right before it shut down, and I had planned to go to it. Yeah. And when it got canceled, I was like, but I still want to see that fucking movie. So I bought it. I blind so bought selfish. it. I know. It's right? all this harassment and, and allegations. Everything. I'm like, I still want to see the goddamn movie. movie. Yeah. Um, so I bought it. I blind bought it. And um, watched it over the weekend. It is crazy. It is so many different movies. Um, and it's very 1980s dialogue. It's very 1980s in general. There's a lot of really big hair in it. Um, the basic plot is this guy from Beverly Hills. Of course, he's from Beverly Hills. Um, moves to Mexico City. <laughs> And um, makes all these great new friends there, and he's trying to get adjusted and everything. But all of a sudden, he starts getting these superpowers and having these weird dreams. And you think it's because they kind of fucked around with a Ouija board on his birthday. Um, and his friend gets possessed and turned into like this Freddy Krueger thing that keeps appearing in his dreams. But then he transitions into real life with no explanation. And it is just bonkers. The whole movie is bonkers. And it par it definitely is trying to pull from a lot of things because it's got some exorcist moments. And then there's some moments where you're like, oh, this guy's clearly seen weed or witch board because they're playing it. Like there's a whole party scene with a Ouija board. 
board. And um, and then it's got all these slasher moments where it's like, you know, he'll find out like Angela's going to die tonight. But Angela's his friend who's a nurse. And you see something like sla- like a slasher film where it suddenly goes to like a POV chasing her around the hospital and then she dies. So it's like everything. Huh, I love it. All I in one swoop. Yeah, it looks cool. It's insane. It is completely insane. And um, usually... With films like this, like something like Death Spa, I always think I really should see this with an yeah, audience because it's going to be 10 times funnier with an audience. Dave and I cracked up this whole time. So this one is good enough that I don't think you need to hold it for an audience. Right. But apparently they have done a lot of Alamo screenings of this one as well. So, yeah. Is it a uh, foreign language? Subtitles? No, no, it's English. It's, it's English. I believe okay. so, but there were some times that I was like, I think he's actually speaking English. Like I just love, that must be the first story where anyone's left Beverly Hills for Mexico. I love that It was that the strangest thing. Move. And, and the girl who is supposed to be the dreamboat knockout in it yeah. has the most kind of Frida eyebrows I've ever seen, where it literally is just like a hedge moving across her forehead. It's It's amazing. Um, oh, that sounds good. Yeah, I, I love it. So, How did you get it? I found a DVD copy on Amazon. I think it was maybe four bucks. It was not expensive, and I will be happy. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. I have already loaned that out, or I would be like, <laughs> I'll loan it to you guys. Um, as soon as I get it back, I will loan it to you. But, right. yeah, it was a, a cheap buy, like, DVD release. It was not, like, a major label. I really um, want us to have, like, start having screenings, like the Shockwave screening, like the, yeah. the this, monthly or bi-monthly at, yeah. at a theater in L.A. where we pick something like that and we just talk about it. And it's not like the podcast. It's just, like, one film. Hang one out, film. Hang out. Yeah, this would thing. be a good one. We should buy a film bar here. Yeah, sh- junk shock waves. waves. First, first yeah. start. So. Yeah, junk waves. <laughs> or junk just have to do no Let's, food. Just keep it moving. Just, just <laughs> movies and beer. I don't want to do anything. All yeah, you exactly. Get. Alcohol we'll, and movies. We'll get I'm a popcorn popper, and that's all you mm-hmm. get. So we'll take the one out of Rob's apartment. All and right. this is it. Done deal. Um, so, but yeah. And the don't, hot dog maker. And the hot dog maker, because that thing <laughs> looks good. And you have cotton candy, too, right? No, I have a snow snow cone thing. That's that, it. It's a little complicated to make that. Our concessions are done. Yeah. But yeah, so that is Don't Panic from 19. 1988. Apparently, this guy, um, his name's Ruben Galindo Jr., went on to make a bunch of other films that are equally bonkers. But um, I started with Don't Panic. All right. Speaking of bonkers, Elric, hit us. I saw a movie by a little director, Dick Moss. Because oh, oh, I've got I caught, one. I caught down, up to the one down. that you had already seen. Yes, I borrowed from Becca. I forgot to bring it. The Lift. <laughs> Great, because I watched uh, Down. Oh, okay, cool. the okay shaft, perfect. So we'll which take Which Becca turns. just talked about. Did, did you uh, enjoy gonna... all of the rollerblading? I, honestly, I, well, let me. Yeah, let, here. Let's start with the lift. <laughs> I will start by saying that Rob's review was 100% correct. What was my review? I don't remember now. Well, <laughs> I, I don't either, <laughs> I but say? I remember the general thing because it almost put me off watching it. It is the thing about the lift. Like, it's still exciting the lift came out. But here's the thing. The scenes where there's a lift in it. Are fucking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but there's way too many scenes not with a lift in it right. at home, domestic scenes, guy like hanging out with some other girl, kind of having an affair, but not enough for my liking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like when his wife was way cooler and hotter than the weird girl he's trying to have an affair with anyway. Right. I was like, what are you doing, dude? Uh, there's just something really quite dull about this movie that, but every actual scene that involves lift is genuinely cool and well shot, looks actually kind of big budget in a way. Yeah. Some of the, gore, the, the, the big head obviously the thing everyone's waiting for a decapitation is awesome there's a scene where a guy knows it's coming he keeps going lower and lower to the ground because he's freaking out and you're just like oh I felt that when I actually like kind of went back in my seat because I also was friends watching at the time and can't do shit that's what it's famous for it's freaking great that that, that sequence is great there's a like a neat scene with a little girl Uh, there's moments where I wanted worse stuff to happen to you know just to really push the envelope because but this is not oh then you should see down (laughs) yeah yeah I'll get get to me this is not even close to the glory of Amsterdam 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 and it's just so such an yeah. epic on every scale because yeah. I mean it's got really like you know impressive action exactly. and yeah. chases no, I mean, and look, slasher murders. Your director calling your movie bones. the lift, you're already kind of tied. You've got an anchor around your head because yeah. you you're got you're ba- and, basing around. And that's around why that. I'm like, why why was that the remake? Okay, so yeah, that's unusual. Okay, so I was curious to watch Down ever since Becca mentioned it on the show. I mean, I had it along with the lift, but you know, I didn't know if I wanted to watch it so soon after the lift. Uh, and so I finally threw it on the other night and I almost, I kind of like it more than the lift only because it's like ridiculous. The audacity of this movie is ridiculous. And so, um, that's kind of what I liked about it. Um, the, it's much more mean spirited. Mm -hmm. Uh, so for example, in the lift, what I found kind of funny was 
the scene with the blind man who just literally like walks in. Yeah. So in <laughs> down, he's got his dog with him and he drags the dog down oh. too. And you're like, oh, and kinda... it's it's a long scene. Like it's, it yeah, takes he's forever kinda holding for that on dog to the dear to life, and then the dog goes with him. And you're like, oh, that's kind of nasty, yeah. but all right. Uh, How much long later is this film from the lift? Is a, it like a, a decade like ten or ten years? Isn't yeah, it? because because this was you were right. It came out. It came out in 2001. Yeah. a few months before 9/11, and it's yeah. weird because they do keep making reference to terrorism. Like, terror is taking oh, over yeah. the world. But it's a much more interesting setting than... That's the other thing is it's not really a... I mean, it is a remake kind of, but literally the the elevator, the decapitation is like that and one other set piece, the thing with the blind man. Right. Otherwise, it's a completely different story. Yeah. Right. It's a different version of what it is. Because in the and original, so it's only, just a random building with different types of businesses and a, and a rest. Yeah. It's kind of all over the place. Well, this yeah. it's similar. Well, like they make it clear that it's something like the Chrysler building or the Empire State because there's these tourists going up and down, but at the same time, there's a daycare in it and a hair cuttery. There's, oh, God. And, yeah, because there's a whole daycare center where like a little girl like walks out towards the elevator. Which is like, like Run by a Nazi in the and remake like, oh, version. No. Yeah, it's bizarre. Yeah, so but I can't, I mean because it's so re- like insane. Like I could I was laughing. I mean you know, now Naomi Watts is a terrible reporter. Oh, in she's it. in it. That's right. And her, yeah. her accent keeps changing. Did yeah. you notice yes, that? Yeah. Like it's she'll be you know talking without well, the accent, early, yeah. and then she suddenly picks up this weird New York reporter accent yeah, yeah. and starts talking <laughs> really fast and his so girl on, Friday issue. On a, on a camp level, yeah. it's amazing because it's totally like there's you can't take this the roller. Blader scene, I like. I almost the couldn't Wolver believe my Blader eyes. The scene is amazing. Yeah, it's literally like an executive note where somebody said, "You know, rollerblading's really hot right now. Yeah. We should put some of that in." And they just so put he, it in. He <laughs> shoots a five-minute rollerblading scene like out of Amsterdam. It's like the most exciting oh, thing wow. that you see like through the streets of New York. And then one of the guys ends up in the parking lot of the building, and he's like, he like, he's like, he's like tying his shoe or something. And the elevator opens, sucks him in, and then <laughs> sucks about eighty-seven floors out. And you're like, what? the hell did I just see? Yeah, it's a, so it's kind of book. amazing and I do like the ending to this the, the down better because they actually expand on what it is. There's actually more yeah, of I a, mean the lift is what, like some weird goo and maybe the goo on top of the circuitry came a, from a bolt of lightning but no, you don't there's, know. There's an actual uh, and yes. Michael Ironside is behind it which of course is always a plus. Yeah, I this just assumed he was. Knowledge. He's not even in the lift and I blamed Ironside. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not even in your movie. Uh, did, is there any kind of documentary that explains how the hell and why the hell they would have remade this no, movie? And you should read Mike Gingold's um, insert. Oh, his insert. Okay. Yeah, okay. his insert, which I believe is on down. Um, the insert that's included in the, the Blu-ray yeah. is by Gingold, and it's really um, it's still, there's still some unanswered questions over why they selected well that film. Be, yeah. Yeah. Um, and exactly how kind of the insanity that is down came about, but it gets a little bit more into kind of the transition. But that's yeah. what timing that we both start lifting down. There I you know. Go. Perfect. Perfect. Well, what else did you see, Elric? Because we just did two and two Let there. Let me ask before I, I speak too, <laughs> too much on this film. Is Wish Upon a Blumhouse film? No. Why would you care? No, I, I, it, it wouldn't have tempered me at all. <laughs> but Why did you, you can, watch you that? Can, okay, so we've all given that. I haven't. He, seen he seen wanted a, to make his top thousand of 2017. <laughs> I haven't Brian seen Collins suggested exactly. I haven't seen uh, a lot in the last couple of days because uh, I just started working. It's been super stressful. I got home super late last night, and they need to sing "Mindless." Wish upon had just become free on Amazon Prime, so I was like, "Oh, well, that's easy." You're into right? multiverse theories. What's that? You didn't hear it. That's like the best line in Wish Upon. Oh, you're in oh, yeah, multiverses yeah, 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 yeah. too. Um, As okay. we give him shit, I'm adding it to my Amazon Prime. It's Continue, it's, please. I oh, view, God. The way I would best summarize Don't do it, it, Rob. This is, I'm going to call it, the, it's the Kenny G of horror. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 what, and unfortunately, people are going to go, oh, no, but that could be really good. No, it can't be. Uh, <laughs> because in this movie, the worst scene of the year. So this, this film is unwatchable. You know, all, all glossy made films like this tend to be very watchable, even when they're not good uh it's it's it pushed my threshold for the bad bully like bad bully scenes really ruined quite a few things for me last year e- even scenes of it that i follow too much as we talked about uh scenes in the 13 reasons why where, it, where it's just generic obvious bullying they're not going to the nuance of what bullying can really feel like or be and then this it literally has girls walking up to other girls like slamming them into lockers taking their starbucks throwing it at their artwork you're like what the fuck are you sw-? like this is made by someone and, and i don't this isn't the hit on the director per se because this can be in the script. I don't know where this exists, but it feels like somebody's just so incredibly out of touch with a teenager.
teen experience. It's it's unbelievable to me how like non related to actual teen youth this film it's feels. It's like to when me. Wes Craven made um, my soul to take where maybe yeah. that he was we had even more because at least <laughs> the they had him dialogue. Like at least, at least Wes <laughs> wanted you, do to. Do you make... use Fang time a lot? <laughs> yeah, I like I like some of that's funny. At least I will never forget. What's the? Did it get hot in here? Somebody turn up the prayer conditioning. Oh, that prayer prayer conditioning. One of my favorite lines. Doling out fives <laughs> and nines or whatever the numbers. And are. by the way, for my fellow 3D junkies that have 3D TVs, my soul to take. The only way to see in 3D is on Vudu. Oh, well. I've yet to rent it that way, but I will watch that movie in the third dimension. Oh, my goodness. Just saying. Um, what's, who, what's the actor who looks like Justin Timberlake, but his name starts with Ryan, and he's in um, I Know What You Did Last Ryan. Night? Ryan. Oh, Philip, no. Phil, Philip, there you yeah, go. Ryan the <laughs> That's how I get oh, to it. He is the dumpster Phil, diver turned rock star. He's a dumpster star. diver. Di- okay, no, but there's a scene in this movie that easily makes like this is the scene of 2017. If Devil's Honey got so much of our weird joy because yeah. of the sex, there's a scene where he is playing like the saxophone. Uh, and it's this is where I'm getting the even though it's not Kenny G's instrument, but it felt like it. It's he's playing that kind of music, that kind of cheesy like classic rock, the kind of thing that no young person on earth wants a bar of, right? It's like and, what you listen to in the so, grocery yeah, store. He's playing it and swaying in a room, like, and it's all kind of weird, sexy. And then his daughter, her his daughter, and her two friends are sitting there watching him, like in co- total adoration, like it's the coolest music they've ever heard. And it is the most fucking off, out of place scene I've ever seen wow. in any movie. You like because. Because it's just there is no teenage girl A who wouldn't be totally embarrassed by her father doing that. B the other two <laughs> girls would have to have no. It's just everything about it is so weirdly dated. You're like, there's literally some guy, you know, a, a seven year old guy is like, oh, this is sexy, this is hot. You're just like, no, it's not. These teenagers wouldn't even. It, 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 you remember the scene, right? I do. So My issue with the movie was that there seemed like um, weird holes for me. Like mm-hmm. she she has a space with her dad. She has a room there. She lives with her dad, but yet she keeps staying with their friend. Um, who is the girl from Twin Peaks whose name is escaping me right She's now? The who gets, yeah, yeah, she keeps like staying with the neighbor. Um, and she is like mortified to the the fact of hating her dad because they're poor and he reclaims metal. Um, and dumpster yeah. dives for like bed springs. And she's like, oh God, dad, I can't believe Like she's like ready to kill him. But I'm like, yeah, it's eh. a weird, no, what it is, it's a weird, there's the stakes are, are misplaced. So what, what the problem, cause there's some cool stuff. The box idea, all of that could be really fun. The box itself you know, was yeah, pretty cool. It's looking. interesting. What happens is you have a girl making wishes that are coming true and then somebody is dying awfully somewhere else, but she doesn't know it. For 85% of the movie. So she just keeps making wishes and people, we cross cut to someone dying. There are no stakes in that movie because she doesn't know bad things are happening till way towards the end. So, so far she makes these wishes, nothing bad happens to her and people die until she, like, I think it was like almost in the last 20 minutes where finally she went, oh, maybe my wishes caused that. And you're like, <laughs> it is so too late now. So it, it just misses like creating any kind of tension of stakes. It, so it's just two parallel storylines, one with your final destination kills and one with really boring high school teen stuff. The, the main actress at first is like, eh, she's watchable and okay. But man, this, this yeah, it's, it's a mess. Of See, movie. my scene of 2017 from that movie was when they're in the car and she, ta- she literally says, have you ever thought that when you make a decision in this universe that there's another universe where you make a different decision? And the guy sitting next to her goes, oh, you're into multiverse theory? <laughs> you mean the theory when? And he went on to explain it. And it just felt like somebody was like, oh, we should explain that there in case somebody doesn't know what a multiverse is. Yeah. And that was the one where I was like, oh. Yeah, just trust me and watch it for this music scene. (laughs) That could be cut next to Devil's Honey. They're like they're like the total opposites. One is a guy playing, you know, sex for his teenage girls, and the other one is a guy playing a saxophone to a woman's vagina. You know which one you want. (laughs) Come on, (laughs) it's a beautiful thing. Here's the full G. But I will say, uh, Wish Upon is part of their press kit. Sent nail polish out, and I'm currently wearing Wish Upon nail polish on my toes right now. It's really armband. Yeah, I I don't know uh, why the nail polish played into that movie, but thank you for the got free nail nail polish. polish. Don't All question. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I watched Silk from 2006. This is one of the Tartan Asian Extreme releases, ah. which you guys will recommend or recognize as soon as Rob pulls up the box cover. You will suddenly go, "Oh, I remember that box For cover." For some reason, I yeah. thought there was an art house film called Silk. It might be the same there. Thing. I think that there's a couple films called mm. Silk because when I was looking it up, I found a few. This one is from 2006. It's a Thai horror oh. film. 
Mm-hmm. And most people will remember it because it um, has this kind of cube-ish looking thing on the front, like this box. And it was confused with cube at points. I had mm. people like, I remember um, when we got copies of this at Fangoria, people being like, what is this, like a Thai version of cube? It is not. Um, this movie, it's definitely very like 2006 um, Asian art dread ghost story that's coming out. But this one's kind of cool because it also feels like an FBI cop drama. And then it's got this ghost angle to it. And essentially it's about this scientist who develops this material. He calls it the Menger sponge, which is actually the cube that you see on the front is the Menger sponge. Um, He develops this material that ghosts cannot pass through. And with that, if you spray it on your eyes, you're able to see the ghosts. And then you can cover entire rooms in it, and it will trap the ghosts. That's some first world problems. Yeah, right right? I need a silk to stop ghosts coming through. <laughs> and actually, the silk is, um, the reason it's called silk is that the ghosts actually leave behind silk, at, oh, like oh, a cool. residue. And that's so there are these threads that are attached to them. And that's one of the ways that they can tell, like, who's the ghost is about to attack and where it's hmm. been. Um, so ghosts get pissed off about being trapped. They make a big deal that, like, now that you can actually see the ghosts, the ghosts really hate being looked at. And when you look directly at them, they'll attack you. That sounds like the 13 Ghosts remake a little bit. No, it's... Because weren't it's, they all in traps and... No, not quite. Well, 13 Ghosts, yeah, actually, you're right. 13 Ghosts was about trapping the, the ghosts was, because they yeah. did the symbols on the glass uh-huh. walls and everything. Um, this is a little bit different because it's set up as a science experiment conducted by the FBI, which is weird because you've got this crazy eccentric scientist who's been commissioned by the FBI. And then they also bring in like a bomb squad expert who is there and supposed to take control if anything goes wrong and the ghost escapes. And um, th- so they end up letting one of the ghost escapes because they want to see what the ghost will do. Like they want to see where the ghost goes. And so, yeah, it's like a mix of a bunch of different stuff. But if you're into your Asian horror from from the mid 2000s you definitely need to check this one out because it's right on par with the rest of them yeah the review right on the box says the realism of white noise with the sheer terror of the eye yep. see nothing that That's she said right. sounds realistic <laughs> <laughs> like they want to let the ghost go so they can follow him it's like fuck <laughs> it's supposed to it does have this crazy science edge to it which huh. um you know you've got the mender sponge and then it talks a lot about like how do you actually preserve a ghost like if you um use magnets you know like if if we believe that everything in the world is just ultimately energy and your soul is energy is there a way that we can preserve that energy even after your brain starts to deteriorate Hmm. and so it does have this kind of nice science edge to it um does any of it ring true no no but you know it's there they definitely try to add some sciency into it wow i will say there uh, phantom threads and not nothing to do with horror but there's one scene of a ghost probably just the perception of a guy looking you know imagining when he's sick but it's it's so subtly done it's one of the few films i've seen recently where i felt that was a pretty good idea of what an apparition could be to a mm. person like it was just so simply done that it yeah we need to have an, an, an off uh, conversation about that movie okay cool. yeah, which movie was this phantom thread uh, the new Daniel i didn't see this yeah. yeah uh my my last pick of the week uh is a little movie I, I feel like i'm about to get a high five from elric it's a little movie called butcher baker nightmare maker can i huh. oh, there it is i have I love this thing this <laughs> on my desk and i am waiting do you have to the watch. blu-ray uh, this- no actually what i have um was before the blu-ray re- was released one of our listeners sent me a bootleg and so well, I've had that you for must a while. Take, you I must need take it. my high def Blu-ray. I need yeah, they put out a really Ray. good DVD beforehand too. Like for well, all years. right. So the DVD was put out by Code Red, yeah. mm-hmm. and then now Code Red has done a, an exclusive deal with uh, Diabolic DVD for a limited run on Blu-rays of some of their titles. Oh. And so Diabolic DVD has the exclusive Blu-ray version of Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker, aka Night Warning from 1982. Uh, this movie is a sheer lunacy from that yeah. period. It's like, a, I remember seeing it back in Long Island at a midnight screening and uh, not really sure what the hell I was watching because um, because my best friend in New York uh, is gay uh, and we're watching the movie. And it's it's one of those weird things where it plays into the plot but it's really uh, – it borders on homophobic, although they give you kind of a uh, – like the gym teacher is kind of like a like supposed to be a strong role model and like our lead character doesn't care. But basically our lead character um, – there's there's a Final Destination style crash in the opening of it's the amazing. movie, which like, is yeah. actually pretty amazing. Did you do you think uh, Neil Marshall saw that pre descent? There's I feel like those two are pretty close. I'm gonna in have a good to, way. I'm gonna have to find out. Yeah, you know. <laughs> uh, so there's that, and so the child of this couple is left with his aunt and grows up with her, who is played <sighs> by 
and off the rails, Susan just, just Tyrell. One of those great performance. It is one of the crazy, and it is like right from the get go, extremely like like. Um, uh, what's the word? I'm like Ed- Oedipal, like basically yeah. very inappropriate. She's like hovering over him while he sleeps before she wakes him up sort yeah. of deal. Like she's kind of in love with her nephew. It's really creepy. And what happens is he wants to go away to college because he's like a basketball guy. Uh, his biggest competition, by the way, is a very Ew. young Bill Paxton. Yeah. Oh. He's the one that uh, fights him uh, on the court. And then uh, <laughs> and in order to get him to stay, the plumber comes over. And uh, Susan Tyrell pretends that the plumber tried to rape her and she kills him. And so now there's a murder investigation. She's like, you can't leave me alone now. But then the detective played Bo by Svensson, um, Bo Svensson, who Walking is tall too. He shows up and finds out that this guy, the plumber, was actually gay and with the coach. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. And so he keeps he's like, how could he have tried to rip you if he's gay? You know, yeah. sort of thing. And so that's that's like the, the driving force of the plot, I guess. It's, it's less how and more why. But then <laughs> it gets right. ill. But then it's like, you know, constantly throwing out, you know, uh, the F word uh and and you're like you know really um because the kid is like you know i don't have a problem with my coach you know he's a good guy this and that yeah and so did you murder him because you're having an affair with your coach like it gets really kind of out of control but the third act uh becomes a friday the 13th level slasher film with susan tyrell just going for it uh and it is unlike anything you've ever seen the greatest thing of all time which i think you told me about and i was too scared to watch it until this time yeah is there's a special feature, it's only 10 minutes long, where they attempt to interview Susan Tyrell, because she's no longer with us, Mm -hmm. it was right before she passed, and um, they attempt to interview her, and she doesn't want to do an interview, so they just show her the movie. And it is literally her reactions, to like it starts out with like, what is this crap? Why why am I watching this again? (laughs) I I hate this movie, why did I do this? And then like she'll watch herself, like freaking out like, (laughs) That's pretty good. That's actually <laughs> this scene's great. I, lo- I love this. It's like Abel Fur doing his commentaries. They're great. It's amazing. Oh and then like God. she starts attacking people. He's like, "Yeah, get him, get that bitch, or whatever." Yeah. And it's just like she's so happy. She's like, oh, I-, "I want a copy of this when you're done." <laughs> and it's like one of the greatest special features I've ever seen on on a release ever. So uh, you can get that at Diabolic DVD on it's Blu-ray. It's a really enjoyable movie. Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker. Yeah. Oh wow! Unbelievable. And Unforgettable. She's, and she's also a great actor. That's interesting when these actors like perform something like that. I think some people would watch and go, oh, this is where her range is. But then you watch Fat City and you'll be like, yes. oh, my God, the subtlety of her performance in that movie is incredible. So, yeah, interesting actress. I don't know a lot about her in the later years, how she kind of uh, maybe fell out of the industry, but I have to read more about her. I always got her mixed up with the woman who plays uh, Laura Dern's uh, – Laura, oh, Laura yeah. Palmer's mom. Yeah, yeah. For years I thought it was the same person. And so, yeah, it's, they looked just so well, similar. Well, it's weird because she, she was very ill. Uh, Susan Terrell was very yeah, ill. And, end, and yeah. she had a rare blood disease. And so she lost both her legs. Oh. Oh and so when when they do the interview with her, you like see she has like these uh, these like tattooed wooden legs. Yeah, you know it's, it's really crazy. And and but yeah, I do want to go back and check out Fat City. In fact, I think there's a really good UK all region release. Oh, okay, because yeah. mm-hmm. Twilight Time was the Twilight one, Time so. put it out, and, and it's hard to get now. But you, uh, there's a company I think it's called Intrada. In I want to say that is doing UK releases that are all region. Uh, uh, and I know, so you, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Stacy Keach, best performance. Oh, yeah. So good. I've never seen. Uh, awesome. So, so that's it for me. Anything else? Uh, gang? I will say, um, I read Black Hole for the first time. All time favorite graphic novel. Yeah, I, I, love that I had never read this before, um, and it was actually recommended to me by a Shockwaves listener oh, cool. um, after I had talked about what did I read last? I don't even remember what I read last, um, graphic novel wise, um, Bitch Planet or something like that that I'd read in 2017. Somebody had messaged me and been like, you absolutely oh, absolutely okay. have to read Black Hole. Charles, Charles Burns. Charles Burns. Charles Burns. Yeah. And um, so I found it at the Burbank Library, and I read it on the first day. We had like these torrential rains in LA this week, and I read it on the first day of the torrential rains while sitting on the expo line of the Los Angeles subway while they tried to get the train restarted. Hmm. And um, I was there for like literally like an hour and 15 minutes and I read the entire thing in that time. Yeah, because it's mostly design and yeah, illustration. There's it, only little pockets of dialogue. Little pocket. and Super expressive. Um, so it's it's about a group of teenagers in the 1970s. Um, feels very dazed and confused, but they are all kind of passing around this sexually transmitted disease, which is like Cronenbergian. Yeah, it's very Cronenbergian. And it affects 
affects everybody differently. Like some people get like hideous things on their face. Some people get these giant slits in their body. But their re- the reactions to them are very um, low key. It's not like yeah. oh my god, it's a freak. It's like kind of nor- normal and yeah. lies. It's it's got such an interesting tone. Yeah, it's very much like oh, you got the disease too. Yeah, yeah. and it's really bizarre, but yet so graphic at times that I was like oh my god, like because it, literally it talks about how like these wounds will form, but they don't hurt the people, so they tend to play with them and so it gets really crap i just saw rob cringe i mean it's definitely a sexual coming of age thing but what's clever about it it doesn't tell you what it's totally about it leaves it abstract enough so it's not just literally about that one thing Mm -hmm. Uh, and fincher had the rights for a long time yeah i actually he still does i looked it up so um the version i read by the way was from 2005 it was put out in an entire big book book by pantheon books and so i highly recommend picking that up because you can just read the whole thing and because it is um, not as much dialogue as it is just really cool graphics. Like it's a great me, illustration. Yeah. It was like an hour and a half to read the whole thing. And so worth it just to sit there and read it. Cause it was gut churning, but I couldn't stop. Um, so Alexandra Aja had it for a while. Neil Gaiman was rumored oh. to be doing the movie in 2013. David Fincher was attached. Nothing has come of it yet. But I think he has the actual rights. I yeah. think Fincher retained the rights. So I mean, I'm hoping something it. will happen to it. Um, as soon as I posted up that I was reading that somebody linked to a 10 minute short film film that was made by a fan oh, cool. that was actually really good like um because it was the scene of the girl with the tail in the kitchen yeah, who yeah. does the artwork um and it was that like little 10 minute snippet of him going into the kitchen and seeing this naked girl with a tail there and uh it was it was really well done it reminds me a little i mean not not totally at all but gus van sant's <laughs> first couple films like it reminds me of yep. like my own private idaho world if it was treated like that you mm-hmm. could make it good rather than just stylizing it like a storyboard yeah uh but you know it's i think you would if it sounds too gross for you it's not trust me it's oh, actually, no, I, yeah. I already added it to my yeah the my, sexual my it's, it's totally engrossing <laughs> no yes. if you can do cronenberg it's fine it's oh, just yeah, it's I a just, lot just, of i love graphic novel stuff in general yeah, yeah. this it's one's so particularly fine. it's a lot of body horror yeah. but it's really good like yeah it's dazed and confused with cronenberg yeah. and there's wow. some it follows thrown into that just because it is so much about sexual transmitted diseases in a young world and sex and everything yeah like i've that, got a couple so. of uh but they're not as good as this but i've got a couple of his graphic novels after this that he's made and he's I don't know if he's finished this one trilogy but they're interesting but this this one just kind of it's almost like how Stranger Things works this works in that same way because it's nostalgic in a way and you can instantly beam into their experiences yeah, yeah. it's very identifiable yeah it's it's very much like I felt like I was watching something from the 1970s yeah. and it's cinematic it feels mm-hmm. like a movie more than a graphic novel it really ways. does the way that the the graphics are done and I mean yeah amazing amazing artist but yeah. at that same time it makes it more gut churning because it's it's when you're looking at these pictures like he knows how to make them look or just brutal. Yeah. Excellent. So Black yeah. Hole by Charles Burns. Yep. Yeah. Check Double it out. Thumbs cool. up. All right. Well, uh, let's uh, hear from our sponsors again, and we'll be back with our special guest. This episode of Shockwaves is brought to you by Mixtape Massacre, the board game for 80s horror fans. Mixtape Massacre is a tabletop board game where up to six players play as horror film archetypes and compete in a fictional 1986 killing spree to be remembered. Collect kill tokens as you roam the small town of Tall Oaks and stack up your body count or take each other out of the game in epic brawls. With tons of references to 1980s music, films, and pop culture, Mixtape Massacre will have you laughing while you're slashing. It's available now at mixtapemassacre.com. Want more? The Black Mask expansion arrives this spring, bringing in more gore slashers card and gameplay. Have you gotten your tickets for this year's Texas Frightmare Convention? The Shockwaves team will be there. Other amazing guests include Clive Barker and several of the famous Hellraiser Cenobite actors and actresses, Matthew Lillard, Stephen Weber, Tobin Bell, Ron Perlman, Kane Hodder, Brad Dourif, and many others. Tickets are on sale now, and you can pre-order discount passes. So don't wait. You do not want to miss this con. Visit www.texasfrightmareweekend.com, and we'll see you in Texas. Come touch us on our face. <laughs> Today's episode of Shockwaves is brought to you by Shudder. Brought to you by AMC Network, Shudder is not only a premium streaming video service, but an experience unlike any other. Created for fans of all degrees of thriller, suspense, and horror, Shudder is home to the largest and fastest growing human curated selection of high quality, spine tingling, and provocative films, TV series, and originals, and there's always something new and unexpected for Shudder members to explore. Premiering exclusively on Shudder this week is the film Don't Grow Up. 
And on an isolated island, a group of teenage delinquents living in a youth center wake up to find themselves alone with no one to watch over them. They realize the island has been deserted, or practically deserted. The few adults they encounter on their journey all seem to be infected by a mysterious epidemic making them violent and dangerous. Best described as Skins Meets 28 Days Later, Don't Grow Up, is a tense story of oncoming adulthood reminiscent of John Carpenter's Sold. Shudder is available for $4.99 a month or $49.99 with an annual membership, but our listeners can get a free month by entering promo code SHOCK at checkout. Go to Shudder.com today and find the best collection of thriller, suspense, and horror available to stream anywhere. Okay, and welcome back to the show. Uh, we're very excited because uh, one of the themes that we're kind of going to be doing this month and hopefully a lot more this year uh, is what I like to call podcast crossovers. <laughs> Obviously, we're big fans of podcasts, and it's kind of fun to mix and match personalities. Um, there's going to be quite a love fest going on because uh, off show, uh, we've said many times how much we love uh, Postmortem with Mick yep. Garris. Uh, and Mick has told me that how much that you pretty much love Shockwaves as I well. I do indeed. So back Back on the show is Mick Garris. Welcome. Thank you for having me here. Very this is special excellent. occasion. Yeah. I, I hope so. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, I mean. We had you on Killer POV a bunch. You've been yeah. on Shockwaves before. You've been on Rob's, Rob's Living Room show yeah. that we did once that was together. A, that was a great episode. That, that was, was a great that episode. That was a really good episode. <laughs> we it had Bill homie. Malone there, too. Yeah, Bill Malone. Yeah. Talking yeah. the Fly yeah. franchise. I don't Flies. know why I was so obsessed with that. I just knew that talking to you guys about the Fly would be amazing. We did that one episode <laughs> yeah. with you and Stephen King, but unfortunately there's a technical error, and we lost the episode, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> it is a it shame. Was, it was so really good. And it was like three hours long. I know. And we just couldn't get him out of the room. That story told about Kubrick. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. What a story. Such what an good. episode. <laughs> Lost if only you know. guys could hear it. Oh, oh well, man. It was day. awesome. <laughs> um, well, you know, so, yeah, hopefully we'll be celebrating uh, by the time you hear this. Uh, you're probably wondering, uh, when are you going to hear some more Postmortem with Mick Garris? Postmortem has not been on for like two or three months now. What's up with that? Um, I am changing homes. Are you? Post, Where are you going? Postmortem used to be at Podcast One, and I really appreciate the opportunity to work with the world's biggest podcaster and all that. I don't think they were the best for finding our audience, uh, the kind of niche audience that um, I think would most appreciate it. So I'm going to come to your school. What? I'm what? transferring. I'm making a transfer. I'm going to Blumhouse High. Yeah. Yeah. How, how on earth did this all happen? All I remember is I at some point on a Facebook thread going, is, Nick, you should come party with us. And you were like, hell yes. That's exactly what <laughs> and set it off. It literally <laughs> became Ryan and I on an email chain with Mick trying to get everything going. Yeah. So well, you, we st it started on Facebook. Yeah, Somebody it was on suggested Facebook. It, yeah. And yeah. then you yeah. emailed me and said, are you serious? And I'm like, I will put you in touch with Beck and uh, yeah. Ryan and yeah. see if we can make because it happen. Because it was just at the time I was feeling like, you know, I, I, I don't know if our audience is being best served in this way. It was a great opportunity, and the podcast one people were terrific and tried their best, but they're used to big radio stars and big TV stars doing their multi-million dollar deals and the like. And it was, you know, we would do our, our show in their palatial Beverly Hills studios. Yeah. And now this will be in BH Studios, but it stands for Blumhouse, not Beverly Hills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it, it just feels like, you know, you guys have been friends for years. Yeah. And it feels like home and family. Oh, yeah. And uh, that's that's kind of important to me because you don't make a living being a podcaster. No, none of us are Adam doing Carolla. it for that. Yeah. It's... yeah and... We're not big and palatial, but we do have this badass poster behind you of a girl's face melting. So. Which, is, which, which movie is this again? This is The, the Terror. Right, directed it's... by five different directors. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> The Terror. <laughs> well, so what better room to podcast yeah. in than yeah. one They the certainly did poster. not have that at Podcast One. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But, uh, but they did have air conditioning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, <laughs> just, we have we... to turn it off because it picks up on the mics. Uh, so. Yeah, sure. so we do have air conditioning. We just can't use it. Yeah, not in this room. Yeah. 
know. What's the point? You, but welcome to the fray. This is thank awesome. You. Yeah, it's which very means, exciting. Well, I'm going to want you on more often just to pop in as like a co-host occasionally. <laughs> yes, yes you're, you're right. Read, read the underlining <laughs> yeah, of yeah. your contract because I've put in a couple of clauses just to get you. <laughs> oh, yeah. no. Oh, yeah, I haven't read the red part. Oh, yeah, yeah. Elric <laughs> wants you to touch his face. Oh, yeah. He, he always he's, asks he's for that. that. Yeah. My yeah. Yeah. And, and Becca, you're the one who says, do not touch my face. Do not touch my face. Nope. Well, what's cool? What's cool about our respective shows is they are different shows. Yeah, you know, yeah, we, we do definitely. Obviously, we interview people and we talk about horror and stuff. But they are. I think what's exciting is about being on the same podcast network would be that they're going to complement each other because yeah, yeah. you have a style of it. Like we were talking about it off air before, is uh, our st- like you're going to get a different conversation uh, out of a filmmaker than we would, and they're both equally interesting Absolutely. because of our perspective and our life experience and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I'm a filmmaker, and so most of the people I have on. All of the people I have on are filmmakers Mm -hmm. and they're involved in the process. And that's a change from when I started. I mean, I started interviewing for my high school newspaper. I interviewed the Moody Blues and I interviewed Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix when I was a teenager. Unbelievable. And so I've always been inquisitive and an inquisitor in that way. But the perspective has completely changed. And so when I was doing the Z Channel interviews back in 1979 and 80, uh, it was as a fan and as a journalist and doing it now it's like with friends or people i know or have worked with and the perspective is different and the questions come from a different place and i really like it and we've i've always found something out about these people that i've never heard before right and uh, so i really enjoy the whole process of doing that i and loved I, the walter hill interview you did oh, last yeah. year it was one of my favorite things because he's just somebody hey i was surprised he's even on the show because of you know he's not really hard but he just he again he said things i hadn't read or heard in other interviews and all that alien I, stuff I yeah. yeah it was, it was great the yeah. stuff about robert aldrich i'd never heard that yes. aldrich was that's completely set today. news i haven't to heard me. this episode did you ask about streets of fire please tell me you asked about streets of fire uh, uh, it's not that kind of show yeah oh. <laughs> he's uh, with horror. but we oh, talked streets about alien we talked about uh, tales from the crypt yeah. we talked about and his new movie too yeah, uh, yeah, yeah which was time, yeah. it was great but i had met walter a couple of times at film festivals and we really hit it off and i did a tales from the crypt as a as a director and so uh i asked asked him about it and he said you know what um the timing is really great because i've got a new movie and i'd love to come on and talk about it and i don't normally ni- like to tie a show to the release of a film like a pr kind of thing mm. uh, it's i want my show to be a little more pure than that you yeah know? right but it was walter fucking hill yeah, yeah you might not get another <laughs> shot at something yeah. like that yeah, it's totally- and, and he had you know uh, Let's talk about whatever you want. And and that was the beauty of that show. What the beauty about doing it for Blumhouse is I'm not going to be doing bark box commercials. Right. <laughs> and it's uncensored. Yeah, yeah. If anybody said fuck, it would get cut. You, oh, you're you're yeah, really yeah, excited to curse now. Oh aren't my you? goodness. <laughs> Which Wait, I mean, I'm so well said, known for. If somebody on that show say, said fuck our cane, right? For, it would have been censored <laughs> out on your show. Uh, it would have just been. Uck, L word. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean, because people yeah. were saying that There's every episode. That <laughs> it's like their log line right. for the show. Well, like, they paid the editor for each cut of uh, Fuck L word. Oh, Welcome funny, to yeah. Postmortem Fuck L word. I say yeah. Fuck L word can every week, just not on air. I, I, yeah. I, I it's I not Joe Dante we're talking it. about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you, oh, sorry, you go. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, you know, here's the thing. I, and, I, you know, I, I think I've even told you this. I, I, I look up to you in the way that you have had this interesting career where you started out uh, doing the Z Channel show and interviewing people as as a fan, and then um, kind I of, was doing Fangoria interviews before that. Really? Wow. Yeah. I mean, who was editing then? Uh, well, Bob Martin. Oh, that was no, Uncle Bob. Right. Uncle Bob. Yeah. 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 And then uh, you know, then obviously becoming a filmmaker. So these people that you were a fan of are now your colleagues. And yeah. Now <laughs> you know, kind of. I mean, that's kind of the trajectory I've taken as well. Is yeah. that I started out as a fan that just wanted to interview people, and so do you still get? I mean, obviously, if you still do the show, but. You still get a kick out of interviewing people, whether they're friends, colleagues, or people you're a fan of. I do. I mean, I really love the process, or I wouldn't be doing it. Like I said, you don't make a living as a podcaster. Yeah. Uh, and um, I'm still fortunate enough to be working as a writer and a producer and a director in movies and in television. And not many people get to do it as, as long as I've been fortunate enough to do it. But I also feel a sense of payback, too. I, I really like the idea that we're having conversations that may turn out to be something of a, of a historical record. Mm-hmm. This interview that I did way back in 1981, 82, 
with John Carpenter, John Landis, and David Cronenberg. Which we talk about a lot on here. Yeah. We're huge fans of that. You know, that, it was, uh, I was doing publicity for the studio at the time, genre publicity, which nobody else did other than Charlie Lippincott, who was my boss at Star Wars. And the idea to do this, to promote these three universal movies, American Werewolf and The Thing and uh, Videodrome, which were all coming out the same year, within a year of each other, and do this roundtable, and we gave it to television stations all across the country. And now it's become this document of a period in horror history that is important. Yeah. And here are these guys at the top of their game doing some of their best genre, genre work ever. And now there's a document of it. And they're and comparing can, notes. I love it. Yeah. I love when they're like making, they like can land us and Carpenter. They're just having, not jabs, of course, but like they're just little disagreements. Or it's, it's really fascinating. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's fun to just be a facilitator, yeah. you know, uh, asking questions and not it being the Mick Garris show, but being the platform for these people, for me to find the information I'm curious about. And I still maintain that 16 year old uh, yeah. rock and roll uh, journalist uh, uh, curiosity. Yeah. Speaking of um, interviews in Fangoria, actually just this past, it was over Christmas break, I was cleaning out a closet and I found a box of photos and in there, I'll have to post it up. I found a picture of me interviewing you at one of the Fangoria Weekends of Horrors about 15 years ago. Wow. And wow. you... So that was Masters of Horror. Yeah, that was yeah. Masters of Horror that I was interviewing you for and it was myself and we were on um, the Fangoria web show that we had at the time. We used uh -huh. to have a show on Ustream or one of oh, the, uh, the weird wow. like fly-by-night mm -hmm. platforms. And it was on that. And uh, you look the same because you don't age tuck everlasting. Um, <laughs> but I look different, so. I don't your hair's longer. That. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. actually, your hair in it, it's short. It's yeah. like um, it's like level with your nose. It was much shorter. Yeah, that's pretty long. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's some, some length and girth to that yeah. nose. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, one of the things, you know, kind of one of the ideas, because we, we could go in a uh, variety of directions in terms of what to speak about. And we've let's spoken, do it. We've yeah, spoken yeah, about yeah, so many different. things with you, but but the thing that Elric brought up that I thought was pretty fascinating is you're you're pretty actively going to film festivals. You're always, you know, you're always posting great photos from different countries and, and uh, you know, some... That's giving you tips on Buenos Aires. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was I like, think, no, you yeah. must go to this one place. Which I went. did. You did, yeah. yeah. And I've I sent you in, the pictures. Yeah, it was great. I've run into you many times at the airport going, oh, you're going... Oh, I'm going, we're on the, okay, yeah. cool. We're on the yeah. same flight. I'm the peanut free one. They're about to announce that you can't have peanuts. That's me. That's <laughs> me. Flight. Oh, so, damn. Um, yeah. uh, but I guess. You're why the pretzels. I know. <laughs> I have always the reason for the pretzels. And my favorite, we were coming back from one of the conventions and um, we were there with AJ Bowen was on the flight with me. It's probably and Texas right yeah. there. I can't, but Joe Dante was on the plane too. Oh, right, right. And um, hey. AJ was sitting up front, like two rows in front of me. And Joe didn't know that it was me who was the, the peanut allergy on the flight and they announced like we have a peanut allergy on the flight so no one please bring out your peanuts we'll be distributing pretzels and you hear your dante go oh god damn it and then aj <laughs> bowen texts me and he's like you're the reason your dante can't have his peanuts back on <laughs> which we love really that's pretty great <laughs> Uh, but, but I wanted to start with the festivals because I, I love that you're, um, basically, I mean, look, we're, it's part of the first half of our shows where I was looking for new Chasing things to new see. Thing, yeah. And, and, and it's, you know, it's interesting because you've been in the business for so long and, and worked on both ends, you know, what's that experience from your end and, and what are the festivals and films that you've seen as of late that really excite you? I like, are, are there any, like, I know Sidges is a very horror friendly one. So yeah, oh yeah, it's all is there horror. a particular festival you're looking forward to in t just specifically to discover new stuff? Sitges is great. Um, I love uh, going to be fan in South Korea uh, because I think South Korean genre films are among the most polished yeah. and oh, yeah. most spectacular of, my of all of them, you know, train to Busan and the great. railing, things like yeah. that. Um, I, and I love the European uh, festivals. Sitches is, is the big one. And so there's a lot of stuff from all over Europe. But is Fright I, Fest similar or how, or how are they? I've the never been oh, to Fright been Fest. Fest. Oh, wow. the, you know, Alan they, Jones. Alan yeah. keeps saying he's going to invite me, but I was on the jury at Sitches last year. Oh, cool. So I had to see 30 movies. It's cool, but yeah. 30 movies in eight, eight days is, is a lot of you movies. You don't like prep them before you get there? Uh, no, oh, no. See them there? See them Sitch, there. Yeah. Sitches wow. always sounds a bit more traditional, whereas Fright Fest kind of sounds like, like a party. I thought, yeah. I, I I thought Sitges was more like the con of Yeah, that's horror. what I always, well, I thought it was like a classier thing. It's, it's not a sales thing. You know, yeah. it's, it's just big and it's the most historic. It's been uh, around the longest and I've been there a few times. It was also the first one I ever went to with my first movie, Critters 2, okay. in 1988 wow. or 89. Hmm. And it was an amazing experience to, to 
have your first movie, the timeless classic Critters yeah. 2. I think it's how it's usually referred to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I call it yeah. Leo's Pride. <laughs> <laughs> he's in three. But he's in the nest. Oh, he is? Yeah. 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 yeah come oh, on. Scott Grimes. Wait, pride. you've got the Easter egg. Easter yeah, Bunny, right? The okay, Easter okay, the Easter Bunny. All right, good. And Lynn Shea. The good one. The good and the great Lynn Shea. Yeah, and, and the great Shea. Lynn Shea. Who, yeah. somebody on my Twitter referred to her as a national treasure. Which she is. She, she is. Wrote, it literally yeah. said, like, Lynn Shea is a national goddamn treasure. And she is. And she's right. Absolutely. And she was a blast in that movie. She She's really good in it. Yeah. Um, but Sitches is great. I mean, I, I see a lot of movies. I, I still love the genre. Yeah. I don't love franchise movies. I don't love teenage horror movies. You know, I've got gray hair and, and, and they're not aimed at me. But outside of the United States, horror is not thought of as a young people's genre. It has every bit the respect that um, every drama has. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be about... 18 year olds and you know short sheeting and and uh, a cabin in the woods they are really sophisticated um in intelligent even intellectual and experimental in ways that until recently the united states has not really offered up i mean the fact that everyone can make a movie now yeah. uh there's just how do you see them how do you track them down uh, the democracy of filmmaking where everybody can make a movie is really great because everybody can make a movie and really horrible because everybody can make a movie <laughs> exactly. there's a lot of saturation how do you find the good one have yeah. you seen um i talked about it last week on the show have you seen good manners yet from brazil no i heard the show and and i really want to i recommend it because it's about two middle-aged women going through middle-aged women problems um jobs or lack thereof um, having, you know, being pregnant and not having a spouse attached mm. to it, um, love issues, and then there's some horror in there too. Well, but, yeah. foreign films, uh, foreign, a lot of foreign films don't seem to just buy the idea that there's just a trope. It's more like you can just make a movie that has horror events in it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be fit into what we think of as the horror movie. And, and even that's a, a traditional yeah. horror movie yeah. like Wreck, the Spanish yeah. film uh -huh. Wreck, yeah. they, it has an incredibly adult and intelligent spin on it. And it's like, if I never see another found footage movie again, I'll be fine. Yeah. Especially, oh, the only thing worse would be a found footage zombie movie. Right, right. But, you know, here at Rec, I mean, it's several years ago, but it was so fresh and so great and not made for kids. It's yeah. scary. And Rec scary scared the shit, shit out yeah, of me the yeah, first time really I saw good. it. And the second one's good, too. Oh, yeah. 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 That one blew me away. That's right, and I don't want to keep hating on Wishbone. It's not about that, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'll tell you, you this, sure? is, this is where my confusion comes in when I watch a movie like that and, and maybe, say, The Last uh, Paranormal... Uh, I don't know who it's for. Written because, by last week's guest, but, by the way. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> when, I, when I watch it, I'm watching it going, they're not really trying to scare because the scares aren't really scary. They're not intense. Uh, yeah. There's no humor, so mm. it's not funny. And the teens are wildly misrepresented. Uh, I mean, also, why is a 60-something-year-old man making that? You know what I mean? There's just something about it. So all those things together, I, go, I don't know who this was for. Well, mm. that's also when you do um, giant, 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 like $10 million and above films, you have to make sure that it's something that there's like for everybody everyone. will watch. But yeah. it's Which also no the one. vanillification <laughs> yeah. Yeah. of yeah. a it movie. It gets watered because, down. It yeah. goes, yeah. goes to the least common denominator, yeah. and it becomes uninteresting. But television has broadened out now and has become yeah. a, a better outlet in a lot of ways for horror than feature films because they don't have to audience test them as much, you know, and it, because there, it, it has become a 500 channel universe. Um, you don't need to get 50 million viewers like the stand did yeah. in one night. You can get 11 million viewers and you're a huge hit on broadcast television right. or on Netflix. They don't even tell you how many people watch. They, you just know if it's a success or not by whether they pick it up for another season. So, but, you know, there's, there's creativity to be made in this genre more than any other because a good horror movie has to be a good drama first or a good comedy or whatever. You know, horror comedy is another animal that is almost always neither funny nor scary yeah so it's uh, but sure. when it hits like a, a juan yeah. of the dead or sean of the yeah. dead or something like that you know it's fantastic yeah um, it definitely feels uh, risky i always think like that you're gonna hit the target housebound was one that worked for me oh, I love there's that just movie. some that it, they just hit and if they don't hit it's painful because it's neither yeah. Yeah. you're neither scary or funny i mean that's why american werewolf it's like i feel like bowing down to that it's just uh, the tonal balance of and american the werewolf and, and the they're both, both them, yeah. like back-to-back -back movies exactly and and, and 
you know, I was lucky enough to be around to watch both of those. I'm in the howling. I have a line oh, that's right. at the end. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, American werewolf, I helped do publicity on and, oh, and cool. like, you know, I did the making of scanners and, and uh -huh. making a video drum and things like that. It was like the making of the thing. It, it was a time where I, I am the Zelig of horror. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You are. I think, right. I think, we, are. I think we talked about this maybe the last time we chatted, or you know, sometimes I mix up our conversations. But like, you know, and I don't want to harp too much on the past. But like, when you see something like an American World in London, at least for us of our generation, we we recognize what a special movie it is. Yeah. And yet, my memory is from what I've read that it wasn't really a hit. It was not a hit. It and was so, modestly successful. But you, as a fan, seeing yeah. this thing for the first time, did you get a sense like this is special? How is nobody catching it blew on my mind you know i yeah. saw the cast and crew screening and john carpenter and deborah hill were there and you know a lot of people mm -hmm. went to see it and it ripped up the house you know it was at universal in the alfred hitchcock theater wow packed house cast and crew and because i was working at universal i got to go and it was amazing it was so funny and so scary and so smart and it was written when john was 19 years old and he barely changed wow. it although as he wow. says i took out words like groovy and shit because people didn't say that anymore <laughs> yeah. but people john people never said groovy yeah. <laughs> only in bad movies yeah, yeah. according to scooby-doo they did well there you go <laughs> uh, i i stand correct so we had these masters of horror uh, from that time period and people who were really like they were young making incredible work and then they get older and they're still making great work and then you made Master of Horror of the, and I know we've asked you before hey would there be a young Master of Horror I'm not going there but who are some of the voices that you've seen in the last couple of years who you do see that same kind of that tick, because you can't stay interested on nostalgia alone can I throw one out that I it's, guarantee Mick probably agrees with me on because every movie I've seen so far I think it is amazing and it's Mike Flanagan that's why I, I yeah. assume yeah. You across the board it. Flanagan's great and also the fact that you guys both had both you're both probably two of the people People have done the most king already. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> well, I think Darabont might be ahead of. Oh yeah, uh, you're, right, Mike, you're right. But but um, from the had, youth market, he's doing. Yeah, but yeah. I I only met uh, I only met Mike not long ago. He yeah. invited me to a screening of Gerald's Game, wow. uh, which I saw at a theater screening. What did you room. think? I loved it. I thought it was great. So hard and to make that film. It was really hard, and that's the movie, uh, the King movie, I most wanted to make. Oh. And so I was, tried that, for I, years. I, I don't want to get catty here, but was yeah. that? How is was that hard to like watch a version of the movie when it's one that you've wanted to make for or, years, or yeah. were you had like wow, all right, he, he did a great job with this material. Well, it was it was both, yeah. you know. Uh, to be quite honest, it was like fuck, I wish I'd been able to make that movie. <laughs> yeah. But thankfully, it wasn't a movie where I go, ah, I could have made it much better than that. Yeah. Right, right. I would have made it differently a little bit here and there, but yeah. he made a lot of the same choices or made some very original choices. But the movie is really good, and it's really powerful. And and, and one of the best King movies in a long time. The, the problem with modern horror films is there are very few opportunities for people to keep going back to the bat. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll make one really great movie and then what happened to them? Yeah. Right. You know, what's Jennifer Kent going to do next? Right. You know, yeah. uh, she's she's been direct. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. The Babadook, Sam, Babadook, yeah. Babadook yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is I it's that's the sort of thing I, you're yeah. talking yeah. about modern masses of horror. Yeah. I love the idea that there are more women making horror films, yeah. that there are more ethnicity, you know, yeah. because of going all around the world and seeing international horror from all different kinds of uh, uh, of of communities, it's really exciting to be uh, introduced to a neighborhood that I don't live in. You know, I love that. I think, well, obviously, get out. You, uh, yeah. you can't talk about the horror. teacups right there. You can yeah. look at the teacups. Yeah. You okay. can look at the teacup. It's <laughs> sitting on the shelf. You can't talk about horror at uh, at Blumhouse without mentioning. Well, and it, also, but... it is significant, especially when the Oscars come around, because it will have been. I mean, Science of the Lambs obviously a horror thriller, yeah. Uh, yeah. and the only other one is Sixth Sense. But enough to, before that, no, before that is Exorcist. That's a yeah. that's a forty that's a year. Of a window wow. that's, that's so it's significant that if it could yeah. really win and i predict it will win uh um uh script i actually genuinely believe he will win i hope so yeah I hope unless I, lady I, bird I it deserves it <laughs> i hope not it, but but, but things like that i think uh andre overdahl uh, uh -huh. you know the autopsy of jane uh, doe yeah. and, oh god and, that and was troll like, hunter was and fantastic. i feel i feel people still haven't really discovered autopsy like no, yeah, yeah, yeah. that yeah. should be a modern it classic was... of really just creepiness and it took me two times the second time the first time i thought this is really interesting but i don't know how i feel the second time i watched it i
I thought, this is a masterpiece. Well, we saw it in the theater, and I, you could just, yeah. it was the theater. That it was, was the experience. Such I could a good feel vibe. I was, yeah, reacting, Elric and I saw it at the was, same time. And it was our number one for that year, it, both it was, of us. It was super live, yeah. you know, screening. So. I saw it at Sitches, where, you know, I was still oh, yeah. jet lagged yeah, and, yeah. and one of 30 movies that I watched in a week. So, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, that rings through. You know, Hounds of Love, I thought was yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. And I just got yeah. to work with Emma Booth in Once Upon a Time up yeah, in cool. Vancouver recently. Yeah. Wonderful Australian film. Great everyone's, Australian everyone's strong in that. Yeah. yeah I mean, the acting Disturbing. is great. Girl with All the Gifts, uh -huh. I think, mm -hmm. is, is fantastic. Right. A lot of people seem to love or hate that one. I was somewhere, it felt like a, a good YA, young adult yeah. fiction kind of story. But for some reason, I was left a little. I think anything in that um, The Walking Dead look or vibe is going yeah. yeah. turn off to me right me. now. Yeah, I didn't why. feel that. I, yeah, I, I felt, you know, I was seeing it through this little girl's yeah. uh, perspective. And her performance is great. She, yeah. is, yeah. she blew me away. I voted for her. That was another one at Sitches where I wanted her for best actress. Oh, cool, yeah. And I was the only one. But yeah. I liked that one. Yeah, it was, it, it rubbed me it, not well because of the Walking Dead vibe. Like, I was not in. I don't I'm watch not in Walking a, Dead. I'm not so, in yeah, a zombie mood yeah, yeah, anymore. Sense, yeah. I, I, yeah. If somebody's going to throw zombies at me, it has to be really impressive. Train to point. Busan and. Oh, totally. that one? I'll take the zombies. And Girl uh, with All the Gifts. They were both at Sitches. And I felt like I never wanted to see another zombie movie in my life until yeah. I saw those two movies. Yeah. They were both fresh. And we mentioned earlier the, the South Korean films, The Wailing and Train to Busan. There's something really interesting. They're not afraid to go emo in their horror movies in <laughs> oh South God. Korea. The Wailing yeah. is such, it's just a downer the whole oh, time. And then so you're like, exorcism. oh, this is miserable. Yeah. And then it gets worse. And then it gets even worse <laughs> past that. And, and they're three hours long. Yeah, and, yeah we saw that in theaters yeah. together, right? Oh, I, 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 we I love that I didn't understand it all. Like, we were, yeah, we were all kind <laughs> of shaken by it. Culturally, yeah. it's mysterious because you don't actually understand some of the significance, but it, it works because it has atmosphere. That's mm -hmm. what excites you know? me. You know, yeah. Asian films are like that. And, yeah. and, and you know, just... Treading somewhere other than your neighborhood is, is really exciting to me cinematically. And, and I still feel like I'm learning a lot every yeah. time out. And, it, you know, I'm at the point in my career where, uh, you know, if I'm not going to learn something from a job, why take it? Right. Or if I can't be excited about it, you know. And even Once Upon a Time, I love doing that show. And I'm doing things I've never done before, doing somebody else's show. Somebody, somebody else uh -huh. wrote it. I don't have any input in the writing. But... They give me free reign within the time and the budget to, to do these things. I'm working with a kind of visual effects I've never done before, working on a, a full green screen stage with nothing there oh, wow. yeah. other than a, a digital sketch that's on the monitor huh. when you move the cameras and stuff. And, and this young cast, I mean, I, I, I just love learning while I'm doing. You yeah. Know? Well, that's probably why you're still doing, you know, yeah. Yeah. It, it's yeah. infectious. And, and I, I don't, we didn't even talk about talking about this, but I'm genuinely cu curious because I got to see at Beyond Fist. I saw the trailer for the new anthology series you guys did. Well, I don't, it's not an anthology per se. It's a but, feature. Yeah. But, oh, it's, so it's one feature? With, yeah, it's a feature. But, but with multiple directors? With five no. directors, Nightmare oh. Cinema, and it will be out in a few months. And uh, it's you, Joe shows. Dante? Uh, Ryuhei Kitamura, uh, Alejandro Bruges, who did Juan of the Dead, uh -huh. and David Slade. Yeah, it looked intense, too. Some of the visuals looked really fascinating. It, it was a very minor, you know, trailer. But well, we put it together for Monster Palooza, uh -huh. and uh, it's not online. Don't go looking for it. Yeah. You know, it's a, we'll put something up. But we, I've been trying to do um, Nightmare Cinema since the end of Masters of Horror. Uh, after that show ended, I wanted to do something like it, but international in scope. My original idea was to do a weekly series anthology each one in a different country directed oh, cool by idea. a director from that country and so again the the difference in in cultural approaches to horror was really exciting we did one episode in japan each season of masters of horror and yeah. we did it really well yeah. and miike's film was like so brilliant it felt like a huge budget to that it felt like such a big movie in and ways. it cost a little bit less than the That's average funny. episode wow. But because it was made by a, a Japanese production company in Japan rather than us coming over as an American company. Can he speak Japan, English? Or he, he? At that time, he couldn't. And I, last year, I saw him at Sitches and he... Because I was he just thinking not. I'd love to hear him on I've I've interviewed show. him a few times. It's rough. Did I tell yeah. you guys the yeah. story? It was um, one of the times I interviewed him, he was wearing this Eddie Murphy raw, like red <laughs> leather suit. I've seen him in some amazing costumes. I've seen him in stuff like that. So yeah. literally, there's this picture and he chain smoked the whole time That's I was great. interviewing oh him. 
And so um, and he had an interpreter there and he had yeah. an interpreter. And at the end, I was so excited. I was like, I really want to take a picture with you because I was so excited to meet yeah. him. And he was actually it wasn't even um, he was in New York, but it wasn't for horror. He was doing a children's movie at the <laughs> Japanese Horror Film Festival. It was something about wow, a pig. He makes he makes um, enough every year. Right. I mean, at but at he least, was. Yeah. So I was like, I really want to take a picture with you. And you know how when we pose for pictures, usually if you're doing press shots here, it's like arm in arm, smiling, yeah, yeah, everybody's uh-huh. chummy. He is on one end of the frame scowling and I'm on the other end of the frame with this big freaking smile. And he's in that Eddie Murphy red raw leather suit. Wow. I think it would be oh, worth you there. doing an episode even with an interpreter because I think <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, do, I feel like the things he would say, I'm just so, I, I mean, I got to go to so Japan. Movies, well, I do know? have to say, I asked him um, because at the time audition had just really started uh, to become like a cult thing yeah. over here. Oh, um, I saw that in the theater. Oh, yeah, too, I did too. too. And this is like, happening. this was like mid 2000s when I was interviewing him and he had just done one missed call and audition was just really starting mm. to pick up steam. And so I said, I was like, were you shocked by how successful auditions been over here? Um, how did it do in your country? And he goes, well, 16 year old girls love it. <laughs> and then he went Whoa. on to tell me about how like that horror there is for 16 year old girls uh, and they're who watches movie and he doesn't get why there's like older guys here watching his films, like 20 somethings. And well, I there like, goes everything I just said <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> up in smoke. <laughs> okay. I'm a liar. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm curious how how do you um how do you find new horror movies to watch? Um, because obviously with us, it's things like, you know, Netflix and, you know, we take advantage of VOD pretty regularly. Uh, I mean, I, I love that new movies are kind of available on Amazon immediately for me to rent for five bucks or whatever. Mm. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, between each other and listening to our listeners make suggestions, but... How do you kind of find and watch new horror movies? Well, I got to tell you, and I'm not kissing your ass, yeah. but I listen to this show, and the first half is nothing but you guys talking about the movies you've just yeah. watched. And if I hear a consensus... <laughs> There's never Which a is consensus. Rare. There is often a consensus. Two, two but, out of four? <laughs> but there are a lot of times where, you know, this is where I hear from it, or, you know, unless it's getting press, or I've seen it at a festival. I was just in Buenos Aires and, and at a festival there. There, which was amazing and fantastic, but it was a Latin American film festival that doesn't have an American or English speaking contingent there. Uh, yeah. So all of their Latin American films were unsubtitled. And although oh. I'm studying Spanish, there's no way yeah. I can get through a, a Spanish speaking uh, film and understand it yeah. if, if I have to rely on dialogue. But so I didn't see many movies there. But being on a, uh, on the jury at Sitchins really was an opportunity uh, to see a lot of new stuff. But really, I do get a lot of my horror recommendations. And I don't watch – your business is to see as many of them yeah. as possible. And I don't have to, which is good news and bad news. <laughs> right. Because most of everything is shit. Yeah. And in the horror world in particular, you can get away with a lot and call it a horror movie. And right. it can be just a, a reprehensible experience. Yeah, we don't talk about the ones that we turn off after 10 minutes. Yeah. There's yeah. many I yeah, start on Netflix. Yeah, look, Butcher Baker, Nightmare Maker was a choice. Uh, yes. that I, did. Exactly. I stand by it, the as was the list. Choice, sir. Yeah. But there's <laughs> or many. the devil's honey. I'll <laughs> float around Netflix <laughs> and I'll start. And after like 15 minutes, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm yeah. out. Life's well, short. Well, I'll it's, it's a good. passive experience mm. when you're going to Netflix or Amazon it Prime really or something. Thing, you don't put up the money for it. Yep. But that's another difference between what your show does and what my show does is that I'll talk about movies that I love, but I'm not, you know, I'm going to use the word karma, even though it's not something I'm, I'm really enthusiastic about. Yeah. But I think it's, it's bad form for a yeah. filmmaker to criticize another filmmaker's right. work. I'm right. not going to talk about movies I don't like. Right. Yeah. Right. And, you know, it's, it's, it's specifically about the making of the movies and the personality that uh-huh. goes into it. And that's one of the reasons I love your show is because it, you will call shit, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we try to we at try. least. But we, we go positive. I mean, today is unlucky for me because I had two films. You're just all about some wish upon <laughs> me today, uh, Kane. I, I, I didn't make it. Um, but, but yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think that's kind of why people tune in because we've always tried to be positive. And even the stuff we don't like, we still are positive about because we know how hard it is to get even shit made. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, you know what? Last year was, I mean, now I could say last year, but last year was like, a huge, huge year for horror in general. Yeah, right. So I'm wondering how you felt about a lot of the kind of quote unquote big movies. I mean, I'll tell you this. I, I worked a really long, hard day yesterday and uh, I got out at like nine o'clock, went straight to Target to buy their their version of it mm-hmm. because like yeah. every retailer is a different one. Completely sold out. 
And I'm like, yeah. I can't believe that this is the world I live in where I can't even get a copy of it. And I know they got hundreds of copies, but by the time I got there at 9 p.m., gone. And that's physical media. Yeah. Holy mm-hmm. shit. Yeah. You know, oh, nobody does sign. that. That's a Sold really good out. sign. Mm-hmm. And so I, I honestly can't believe that movie was – I mean, I knew it would be big. It's just it, – that's a phenomenon, quite well, frankly. Well, it's a phenomenon, but it's also an incredibly mainstream horror movie. Yeah. yeah. You know, you cannot like horror and like that movie. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, there are a lot of Stephen King things that can work that way. And he just has such a voice. And although it's not a direct translation of the King book, it has enough of its uh, of its spirit and its personality that it feels like I'm dying to see part two of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, last year and year before were both really strong years. Um, the bigger movies are not necessarily the ones I found most interesting. I think Karin Kusama's The Invitation is Great. the best horror oh, yeah. movie I've seen in years. Mm. And the most recent horror movie I saw was Creep 2. Yeah. Oh, and I haven't watched oh, that yet. It's I like great. It. I like yeah. it. yeah, a lot of people it's love it. The girl's great. great in it. And She's great, and and Mark Duplass yeah. is fantastic in yeah. it, and he created this character. You know, the first one's really good, too, yeah. but those are things that just kind of crept directly from the shelf of Blumhouse into Netflix. Mm-hmm. And you It's know, nice also with horror when it comes from, you haven't seen any advertising, there's no expectations, and you see something that's good. Yeah. That's a great feeling, and, yeah. and that only happens in the indie world, really. You and, know. you know, uh, there's also you know, um, Joe Lynch's Mayhem. Oh, I just oh. saw a couple of weeks ago. I, it's his best movie, and oh, it's wow. really good. It's like every shot is incredibly well. Have you guys seen it yet? I haven't I seen have it. Not, no. No. It's really good. And, you know, Joe had constantly been inviting me to, to screenings and the like, and I was out of town shooting or whatever, and I finally got around to seeing it, and I just had a blast with it. It's it's really good. Um, what else? Did I, have well, you, uh, we all saw – well, I watched it this week, Cell Block – Oh, oh yeah, yeah. assaulted yeah. brawl and cell yeah. broke ninety nine. I, I, I yeah. was sitting in the theater and I could see the side of Vince Vaughn's head. He's like sitting right across, oh, and I was just oh watching this incredibly violent film and just thinking, "This is the coolest thing ever." To that's a film that of the films I've seen like that and Mother, uh, like Mother or not, they're cult movies in the making. Like yeah. Mother, Mother's yeah. one of those movies that even though it didn't really work for me on the first viewing, I can tell it's going to have legs of just being this weird, crazy relic. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Cell Block didn't work for me on the first viewing. Really? I saw it at a um, Fantasia, I think it was mm. this past summer, and I was like. It's just violent. And then I rewatched it. I did. I saw it with a crowd. It's such a crowd pleaser. I I actually rewatched it by myself this past week because it's now on Amazon Amazon Prime. Prime. Yeah. Yeah. It's That's like a, I found yeah. it somewhere for free. And now I watch it as like a straight up exploitation film. Yeah. Like it, there's literally, it's just straight exploitation. Oh, and then it's dialogue. fun. Yeah. Well, just that you know? title alone tells you that. Oh, yeah. yeah. It tells you where yeah, you're yeah. going. But I was still, yeah. when I watched it at Fantasia, I was expecting a little bit more substance, but it, it doesn't have it. Like, I, don't I expect it. it. I yeah. loved it. Yeah, well, I, I think, yeah, think yeah, Bone yeah. Tomahawk is the better movie by far. I, I really, really love like that movie. I don't know if it's by, but for me, by far, I think they're very much of a pair. It's like Tarantino. I feel like. Like these movies are part of a filmography. I think it's that we also enjoy Bone Tom Hulk's genre more. Yeah. yeah, you know, and I don't think they're very different. I think they're both really solid for what they. I, also, there may be more emotion tied up with Bone Tom Hulk, the, the characters. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, it's uh, curse, bo- so. Both are both are to me are works of like that's a voice. This is what I like most about movies. I watch those two movies. I go, it, whatever you'd make next, I'm watching. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. And I've seen a couple Drag movies like that. Even this year, even pavement. something I didn't like. Like, <laughs> I didn't particularly like what the Mexican horror film, uh, We Are. We Are the Flesh. I didn't particularly yeah. like yeah. that. But what it did leave me with is, I want to see what you do next. I'm curious. Yeah. yeah. Like, there's enough of a voice there. I didn't like the movie. Yeah. But I want to know what that person You want to take a shower after that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally God. Yeah. 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 That's how I felt about it, too, where I was so intrigued by it. And I kind of, I love the idea of it that it was completely bad. Shit, I have yeah. no idea what it means. It's just yeah. people literally building a cardboard womb while having sex. But, and but a bad or having original, explicit sex. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But a but a, 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 big, a bold original vision that doesn't necessarily work for you is so much more exciting than another vanilla film that's trying to hit all the marks of a horror mm-hmm. film. The yeah. anonymity of of franchise horror is yeah. just it, it it just eats it all up for me. Yeah. You know, I, I I lose interest if it's you know. Here we go. There's well, there's nothing left by the end. <clears throat> Yeah. Once I've redone it enough times, yeah. Well, you know what else I liked a lot was Green Room. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Green that was Room, my really favorite really movie terrific. that year. That's yeah. another person who I will watch whatever he does Absolutely. now. After oh, yeah. Blue Ruin Absolutely. and Green Room. Blue I'm Ruin is a fantastic yeah. beautiful really performance, too. And it? painful. Yeah. You know, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love when a horror film is not afraid to touch your heart, yeah. you know, to hurt. And even though, you know, I'm a very positive kind yeah. of uh, uh, free-spirited fellow, um, 
I love making people hurt when I, when <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. When I write books or make <laughs> and films. And isn't that common? Like, you know? I mean, thinking of all the classic people you've, you've been friends with, like Wes and people who seem just like gentle creatures, or uh, George yeah. Romero, they seem like gentle humans yeah. who really do enjoy something about <laughs> <laughs> the brutality, yeah, yeah, the pleasure that's, of making someone squirm. That's yeah. a lot of horror film. Right, I think I've, it is. I've tried to explain this to other know? people who have been like, how do you horror? Like, is everybody weird? And I'm like, actually, it's kind of the opposite. Everybody's yeah. really passive. Well, we There's all a get lot it of, out. Yeah, yeah, that's there's a lot system. of vegans involved with <laughs> including it, me, by including the way. Nick. Yeah, yeah. Um, like everybody's yeah. just kind of like we don't, we're not really violent. We love animals. We just like yeah, yeah we're chill. It's Have cool. you seen any where you, it's too much for you? The kind of uh, there certain genres or types of films or it's just you don't like yeah. the, the uh, Serbian type, you know is yeah that kind Serbian of film. Uh, you know, I've met the, the speaking of that uh, director is yeah. this really young, really sweet, really smart guy, huh. and yeah, I uh, it was. <laughs> Not a pleasant experience. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was, I was glad that it was there. I would never want to get in the way of a, yeah, totally. of a movie coming out because I was offended by it no. because I don't give a shit, you yeah. know, and I don't matter. Right. But, um, yeah, there are times where I just feel something is being mean spirited mm-hmm. for the sake of it or to be, uh, provocative. Right. And sometimes that's great. I mean, when Salvador Dali and Bunuel do it by slicing an eye or, yeah. or, or like, Gaspar Noe reminds me of that. Like, I feel like he has that punk spirit that Dolly and Bunuel had. I yeah. don't think I think many people do, but when he does, I'm always like, oh, I like what you're doing. I like that you're yeah. provoking, pushing the edges. Yeah. yeah. And, and then I can't watch those, any of Gasparino's movies a second time. Yeah, See, I understand I like, that. You know? That's how I am. I like the idea of them. And They're if somebody a little ever too says, heavy on rape for me. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, when it goes rapey, I'm yeah, yeah, kinda, yeah. you lose me. Yeah, I, yeah. I enjoy the transgressiveness <laughs> of it. It's the same yeah. way I am with um, Catherine Brulé. Yeah, am I saying Brulé. that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, like Fat Girl. I enjoy the idea. I enjoy the transgression. I can't watch this. But yeah. I think some movies are um, not there. They are very different than the kind of horror films that most of us fall in love with. I think those movies are there to provoke. They're not there to be rewatched. They, yeah. like, some people will rewatch them, but they are really there for that first time viewing to jolt us out of our passiveness. Of I don't think any idea. movie is really intended to be yeah, rewatched. Maybe not. Yeah, exactly. You know, you, you, they're made to be seen. Yeah. Uh, but some give lucky. you a pleasure. So yeah, you want to yeah. re- revisit that like the Burbs does for me. Yeah. Like, yeah you watch the Burbs a million times. Anything Joe Dante yeah, yeah. does has this kind of, of, of feel that it wants to be your friend. Yeah. And the, it works. Yeah, timeless you know? pleasure. His yeah. worlds are set on yeah, the timeline. Absolutely. Which is fun. Yeah. Kind of like Sleepwalkers, which I've expressed my love to you before. <laughs> uh, you know, I love, because I love, because having met you, I didn't, until I heard about, because I wasn't familiar with your books, I didn't realize how erotic and, and some of the stuff, but I find that movie, the sexual stuff, is it's a real turn on. It's exciting, especially at the age I saw it. And, uh, but you told me a second ago that you had a crazy story about um, the, how you got that job, which I hadn't heard. Well, I met on the movie uh-huh. and uh, they with the studio, Columbia Pictures at the time. And uh, they said, we really like you. You'll be perfect for this. I'd not worked with or met Stephen King before. Oh. And uh, we think you'll be perfect. Tomorrow we have a meeting with another director. We just have to do it as a matter of course because of our relationship with his agent. And so they had the meeting the next day, a day and gave it to the other director. Uh, oh, no. Wow. So the other director <laughs> started developing it developing it uh-huh. his way, rewriting a script written by Stephen King uh-huh. <laughs> and created a planet of sleepwalkers and oh. you know all kinds of, I mean, really took it away from the world of, of King. Planet sleepwalkers. Yeah. Probably no yeah. Alice Krug in his one. No Alice Krug, yeah. I love you know, no, I mean, well, <sighs> anyway, so it went so far afield from King's script that there was reason to believe that he would not want this to be called Stephen King's Sleepwalkers uh-huh. anymore, which was the whole selling point. The first Stephen King screenplay not based on uh, any yeah, source yeah. material. So they decided to change horses and they brought me in for a meeting, a lunch meeting, and they said, so we'd like to talk to you a little bit longer. What I didn't know was that after lunch, they said, okay, your office is over here. And they moved me to the office. King had, uh, he had director approval. And this other director had done a television movie that was very impressive. And I had just done Psycho 4. And it was, and so the two of those were sent to him. And so he really liked both, but it turned out he really liked Psycho 4. And 
you know, they're both motherfucking movies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, was say. Like young Mother- Norman Bates and yeah. his mom in yeah. Psycho 4, and of course, Charles and Mary Brady in oh, yeah. Sleepwalkers. And so it was like this, it, it was kismet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's not afraid to do incest. Yeah, that doesn't bug me. Yeah, well, but don't tell my mother. <laughs> so. And I, I love that you did those two back to back because it's like Olivia Hussey in Psycho 4 and oh, Alice yeah. Krieg in Sleepwalkers are oh, like man. the most beautiful. It's like the, the ultimate MILF double bill. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, well, well, and, <laughs> and they're both wonderful people to work with, yeah. and really great, you know, uh, uh, just gorgeous. And one of the things that we talked about, part of the direction with Alice Krieger in in Sleepwalkers, was remember you're part cat. Yeah, and so cats rub up against people; they're very tactile, yeah. and and she took to that like crazy. It was really great how how she's almost purring in every move mm-hmm. and just so seductive in ways. And I, I cast her because of Ghost Story. She mm-hmm. was so she's great. great. And, and I saw that much and later and she's great and in that too. Yeah. amazing. Yeah. 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 And, and so it was, it was a great experience to be able to see somebody and to read someone who you loved in something else yeah. and to be able to cast them in a studio movie. My last studio movie i directed by the way <laughs> yeah. 25 years ago oh wow i yeah. didn't realize that was good yeah. were you did huh. you do a, a commentary on uh, that that disc that came out or no i would have oh all right <laughs> there's no commentary <laughs> well, you know there's what? We, we should try to figure that out because I, I think i think we should get a comment like even if it's well, like i shot a, yeah. a bunch of vhs behind the uh, behind the scenes oh. and i heard about it coming out a month before it came out and i called him and said you know i've got all this stuff and i'll do a commentary if you like and can probably get stephen king to, yeah. to take part as he did on the stand and the shining uh, wow well, so what studio is this uh, columbia sony wow hmm. yep and so but it's bare bones there's nothing on it but a couple of trailers yeah. and the movie it looks good yeah but it's a dvd it's not a blu-ray and uh you know i shot Tons of to stuff. celebrate new partnerships, I could imagine us all <laughs> sitting together and making a really fun. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, we'll talk about that. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see if we can do some sort of incentive. Uh, so, you know, one of the things I, I I love asking about every every couple of months uh, because one of the first times I interviewed you, which I think was just for Icons of Friday, an, uh, a text interview. At that point, you were not watching or interested in in television, but television was a different thing. Wow, when was that? Uh, Maybe 10 years ago. Like, we're going that far back. And then somewhere I was in the doing, interim... I, I, I've been doing mostly television since The Stand in 94. Yes, but I mean, you... I, I guess you didn't really watch... Uh, oh, watching. You were saying watching. Watching, yes. watching that's right. what I meant. Yeah, yeah. You didn't I really you watch making, anything that yeah. interests you. And then a few years later, I interviewed you again, and you completely 180 on it because of Hannibal. And you yeah. were like, well, now I love TV yeah. because there's shows like Hannibal. And so basically now I want to know where you're at at Hard TV because now it's like there's so much choice. There's yeah. so many great voices out there. There's, you know, uh, we've been talking about Black Mirror on on Black Netflix. Mirror is great. And so, yeah, so what's David what's the, Slade's Black Mirror is so great. Well, I'm not there yet. I'm oh, one away from that. I was going to say, which one did he it's do? It's black and white. Yeah, yeah. He did metal. I just okay. finished Crocodile last night, and uh, my God, it was so good and bleak and just incredible. And so I'm, I think and I'm wait right. And you see the place. sixth I just finished I know, I Archangel, wait. and I'm just kind of... That one was okay, but yeah, the, and I'm like, the eh. series gets better as yeah, yeah. it goes okay. along. Well, I think the, the Star first Trek. The Star Trek one was great. Yeah, the Star Trek It's a little less compelling when it's actually doing a Star Trek story. Totally, yeah. But that opening... Yeah. is just one of the best things I've ever seen on television. Yeah. I love Black Mirror, and the the anthology format was always my favorite kind of television because I didn't care about investing in that family you go back to every yeah. week. But in the days of binging, when you don't have to do it every week, yeah. it's a totally different experience. And Hannibal... I still think is the best broadcast TV. I, I recently uh, missed show it. Ever. I had that feeling of missing yeah. the world. I, I well, there's actually, nothing like it. Right. I know, I know what it was. I was watching Gillian Anderson in the new X Files, and I just realized. I, the way you're photographing her is doing nothing for her. The way you're presenting her is yeah. doing nothing. But all, she was she was like a unicorn in that show. She, she had this like right. incredible energy around her, the way she looked. And I was like, oh, that's this mystical thing about filmmaking. Some people can capture that because it is a film, right? It's filmmaking. Yeah. It's the same. Uh, but then X-Files, it just feels like somebody's just filming, putting a, putting in a frame and nothing more, you know? Well, it's that's a big the thing. difference. Television you know? has become cinematic. It didn't yeah, used to be. And one true. of the reasons I think The Stand maybe was so successful 
example was because I didn't watch TV when I was making it. And in the early 90s, most television was still close-up reverse and, and master shots. Mm -hmm. uh, and they felt like because it's for the small screen, it's all close-ups and things. Well, I figured m people see most of their movies on television as well. So yeah. what's the difference? And even though we had eight hours to fill, it's like, we're making a movie. I don't know how TV works. I don't watch network television. We're doing this miniseries, but, you know, obviously the, the schedule and the budget is lower than if it were feature films. But I didn't, I don't, I know, and I'm constantly learning what the vocabulary of filmmaking is, and it's constantly changing and evolving, and I hope to be as well. And um, so... I was making a movie. I was making four two-hour movies yeah. for television. And it, now television has become so cinematic, and Hannibal is one of them. And I think one of the reasons Hannibal was so good is that it wasn't made by and for the network. It was an aggregate of international sales. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Brian Fuller is a brilliant guy. And it's interesting that his stamp is on that show as much as any director's stamp, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, including David Slade. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. His, his attention to um, detail, whether it's suits or food, it, it, it has the, it's obsessive. Yeah. And that comes across as that to me, that's why we watch it. Yeah. And it gets to you emotionally as well. Yeah. That, that, that's the important part for me that is missing from most, most horror movies is that there's not really a human connection. It's all about, you know, the scares and the jumps and the splats and the like. But I really like something that resonates after the end credits roll and that you right. take home with you. And well, I think we often haunting. say that, and it's a pretty classic, is that idea of if you strip the horror out, would it have still have been worth watching? Mm -hmm. Perfect. There's something there. There's something emotional yeah. through line to take you through. Yeah, like I say, it's got to be good drama first. Right, right. And so I think it's much harder to make a good horror movie than it is to make a good drama yeah. because you have all of these tools that go beyond the surface. Mm -hmm. You know, you, how do you project insanity or, or nightmares and how do you take the tools of filmmaking and convey fear to an audience? Whereas in a drama, you can use tears and dialogue and, and all of these things that, uh, interpersonal relationships that you can just photograph nicely. Yeah. But you have to do it eloquently in horror to really get deep inside and not just a, a surface kind of Friday the 13th jump fest. Yeah, horror, again, good horror allows you to externalize a lot of stuff, a lot yeah. of pain and feelings on the and make it actually visceral, right? Which is yeah. what people like Cronenberg, I think, did very early on. Amazingly. I mean, way, he, yeah. I mean, he created body horror yeah. in a lot of ways, even yeah. though Shane Andalou, of right. course, did Touched the same sort it. of thing. But uh, of, of the people you've interviewed because you know uh, you've met and been friends with whose work was it? and this isn't because i want you to play favorites but <laughs> whose work really turned you on at the time at the 20 years ago like as you saw it obviously you liked carpenter you liked Kermit, you liked all that stuff but was there one particular person who was like that stuff really just made you kind of jump out of your skin well carpenter did it from from you know uh, uh from the very beginning yeah um but uh, I, the one who had the biggest effect on me, I think, mm. was Cronenberg. Yeah. You know, when, when I first saw They Came From Within, I saw Rabid first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was at a junky little theater in the San Fernando Valley. And it blew me away. And so it was playing at another theater with They Came From Within or Shivers. Yeah. yeah. And I went back the next day yeah. wow. because I realized, oh, this is the same filmmaker. And those two movies back to back I, on a double bill blew my mind. And I like Shivers even more. I, I love Shivers. I think that's it's, a fascinating it's movie. Great. It's great. I, I like Rabbit a little more yeah. because the, the, it's got more polish to it. And, and it's got it a feels like a real character. movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that, that's, that's why I like Shivers is more like what are those movies that are called nightmare movies. It oh, feels, yeah. I love that it fits into that world of nightmare. Well, like Argento, his uh -huh. movies yeah. aren't about plot. <laughs> and narrative structure and character sense. arc it's not all of that, that. Yeah. they're in a dream world a, yeah. a nightmarish dream world that comes from his brain yeah. and he invites us in and it feels like it lives i yeah. showed suspiria in my graduate ah. class yesterday and a lot of my students absolutely loved it and some of them had never seen anything like that before like i mean oh, this yeah. is not a horror class this was just a general directing yeah. class and one of the students goes they act weird. And I was like, could you elaborate? And he goes, 
they just, they move and they talk really weird. And I was like, yeah, they do. Don't well, it's they? Dubbing. It's dubbing. They just, but not even <laughs> yeah, that. Well, like even not. like when they talk to each other, it's very unnatural. Like it's not natural acting in yeah. that. It I just, feel like in that movie, it's because they're kind of, he, his idea was for them to be children. And so now he, get, but then he cast older, but he kept them childlike. Yeah, right. I think it creates yeah, this yeah. very Good interesting point. Thing. Good point. With you the, know, oh, you're right. Uh, that makes sense, especially that with the essence snake. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Even well, it's like a grim fairy tale. Totally. Yeah, I mean, it, and it's, it's even in Germany. So it has it's Olga's character so and how she's so yeah dismissive but playful. Yeah, it makes. But sense. you have to. You always have to because the reason I was asking that because I, I had a similar reaction to Spear. I, it, it jolted me in a way that I didn't really know. Like you know, I'd never seen Argento at that point, and it, I didn't yeah. know if I liked it or not. But then it stayed with me, and then when I returned to it, I realized no, I loved it. Yeah, I just didn't know what yeah. to make of it. Yeah. Well, I saw yes. it when it first opened in 1977. Oh, wow. Uh, on Hollywood Boulevard in a theater on Hollywood Boulevard, and then just a couple of months Star ago, Wars, right? Was we, right well, that was right down the street, yeah, and same. it was released by 20th Century Fox, but they didn't want to put their name on that oh. movie. Oh, wow. I didn't even it, know they put that. It out. was distributed by International Classics, oh. but that was Fox. 20th yeah. Century Fox released it, and it was amazing because it was in stereo uh -huh. and not many movies were star wars was a big deal because dolby stereo had never been done before and it was at the chinese and uh and suspiria was playing at a theater that's no longer there the hollywood theater and it was amazing to a couple of months ago go and see the 4k right back on the boulevard and you introduced it yeah and introduced and, yeah. and interviewed right. dario yeah, there yeah, and cool. and you you saw the 4K there, oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. you saw it there. I didn't right? see it there, but I have but you, the yeah. the I have. Oh, the but on the big screen, the sound and image were amazing, yeah. better than when I saw it in 1977. Oh, cool, that's great. You yeah. know, it was just. Gorgeous. I think actually the sound was the thing that surprised me most. I, I, I anticipated the images to always be beautiful because they always are. Yeah. The sound was so intense. Yeah, and it was so surround perfect. then, yeah. but uh -huh. this was even better. You know, and it was in the same location, basically, you yeah. know, on the same block that I'd seen it 40 years before. I, w I Something that blew my mind, I actually saw a, um, the stat from the year it came out, and it was showing, like, there's a, uh, there a photo still at one point, and it says, like, top box office grosser, and Suspiria is like, you know, number. there's one month where it's like number three, and you see Star Wars at the top, and you're just even thinking of that on the charts yeah. in America is mind-blowing to me. It's but wow. movies only opened, sometimes they would open in just two or three theaters yeah. in a big city, and then they'd roll it out. Wow. It's not like now where everything goes wide from the very first day, yeah. you know, when you met. So just hearing that Cronenberg had that his films had that impact. What was because I, I don't think I've ever asked what was the first interaction you ever had with him? Was it as a journalist or? was doing publicity on scanners? Oh, yeah, okay. Actually, no. You know, the first thing and I didn't know it when I was working at Star Wars, um, you know, I was answering phones. And I operated R2-D2 on the yeah. Oscars that year and stuff. Oh, that's so cool. But I had just seen Rabbit and they came from within, shivers. And I wrote him a note saying how much I loved it on my Star Wars stationery. <laughs> oh, that's good. And sent it to him. And years later, when I was doing publicity on scanners for Avco Embassy, and I finally met him... Um, that was our first interaction. And I said, you know, uh, several years ago, I was working at Star Wars and I sent you know, I still have that note. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, uh, maybe he thought it was George Lucas, but it wasn't. You know, uh, so. <laughs> but um, that was the first time I had any interaction with him. And then, you know, got to know him pretty well. And, yeah. and uh, he acted for me in a couple of things. He was in a, a right. mini series called The Judge. He played uh, an investigating uh, police officer. And uh, he was in a, a, a series, I did an episode called, uh, uh, of a series called Happy Town. And he played a veterinarian with a comb over. <laughs> and he was great. He's, you know what's funny about him? Because I actually think he's a really good actor. I mean, like, I think he's really good in Nightbreed and he's stuff. He's gotten good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but no, and, and he was in a great little Canadian last night, it was called. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I think yeah. he's really good in that. But what's weird about Don him, McKellar? Don McKellar's yeah, film. Yeah. But what's weird is, of all the people I've ever seen, like, interviewed and stuff, he seems like the least likely, because he's so cerebral and stuff, yes. who would want to act. And yet he's even appearing in Jason Voorhees' movies. What, what is that, do you think? Like, what part of his personality? If you ask them. any director yeah, to act, hams. they'll probably say yeah. Okay, all right. Because, you know, you spend your time guiding or helping or allowing actors to achieve their best performances. Yeah. And, 
you're behind the scenes and, and there's a reason for it. Not all of us are leading men. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, you belong behind a camera instead of in front of it. But, um, you know, everybody likes the opportunity to do it a little. Landis was the first guy who started yeah. casting directors in cameo parts. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I did it for him. I had him in the stand and he's in a couple of my movies. I'm in a couple of his. I'm in The Stupids and, and I'm a zombie in Michael Jackson's Thriller. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it's act, uh, directors don't get to see each other work. You know, they never work together. It's a very singular job. Mm -hmm. And to be able to have somebody on the set like that, to be able to watch how they work or have them work with you or... Uh, directors are hams. So like you Landis and um, a Spontaneous Combustion by Hooper. Oh, yeah. And I think that's just, it's just, just uh, funny. It's like, you know, you know who these guys John are. John is one of the funniest human beings, if not the funniest yeah. human being I've ever met him. And probably one, on, on your interviews, particularly with him, I was reminded because he was the first time I ever got to do like a live thing. And it, it, I realized how traumatic it was. I love that he even tries to take you to task. Like, Absolutely. <laughs> he's so sharp. That's the thing, right? Like yeah. you'll hear him and Joe talking and you. And then if anyone even gets a date wrong, he'll jump. On them yeah. <laughs> about the day. No, no, that was 1942. Like, yeah. he, there's and no, he'll chastise yeah, you. Yeah, it's not <laughs> just correcting. Yeah, you. there's no leeway with yeah. it. It's kind of great. But, but uh, he's he's fantastic, and you know, a lot of people don't realize what a heart he's got because yeah. he does. He's brash, yeah. and you know, if it comes in the back of his head, it comes out the front of his head. Right. And and that's great. And yeah. I love his lack of filter, and it comes through in his movies. His personality yeah. comes through his movies, and 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 like you were talking about. And this has been a real wide circle to get back to is that films that have a personality reflected by their filmmakers um, is pretty exciting. And that's what you look for is is a voice that that is original and that carries its own weight, you know, and that you were saying and you were saying, I want to see that next movie by this guy, this woman, you know. Yeah, it's the thing that keeps us interesting. And as you're talking about with uh, different minorities, different international people, films by women, it's that we talk about it quite a bit here, but it's. It's the thing that's going to keep this alive because the stories are going to, we, even if there's only a set amount of stories, there's an infinite of ways how we're going to reveal them the or through the veil exactly, yeah, yeah. of their experience. And I want to see something different. That's yeah. all I always want to see. Yeah, I, and I don't want to see privileged white guy stories. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, stories about rich white people or yeah. or books about rich white authors. Unless they're society. <laughs> I think society is a great <laughs> yeah, white society. male privileged uh, maybe. Yeah. Brian, yes, Brian yes, thank you to you, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. No <laughs> I can't remember if I mentioned it last week, but since you you're talking so much about Cronenberg, and technically, I I don't know if you could consider it horror, but I finally watched Raw on Netflix. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's that's just, a horror I was I was very blown yeah. away by how that styles, movie man. made me yeah. feel as a vegan. <laughs> as a vegan, I'm sure. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, that's a powerful movie, and again, it's a woman's voice, and I think yeah. only a woman could have told that tale. Yeah, I think and, it's one of the best debuts in a while, and not, not yeah. just not so much as a horror movie as just this movie, this like aesthetic. I think she has the way she uses music and yeah. imagery. Mm-hmm. I'm like yeah. that is interesting. Yeah. Like, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, well, like I said, soul. Karen Kusama. Of course, yeah. Yeah. I think she her segment in XX is amazing. She but directed the Elric's uh, son in that. Yeah. Yes. Dad. Uh, Dad, my son's the little the flashback to the devil. Really? He is, he I is didn't technically know Rosemary's that. baby. Wow. Look at that. Look at you. He's, yeah. he's only okay. one flashback. It's and, great. And it's it was great. not easy to get it done. I bet. <laughs> good good, tells good me. luck with That's a three year old. But you know, the invitation is a voice that and and it's. A specifically L.A. voice. Mm-hmm. It's right. very Los Angeles movie. Yeah, yeah. And and now too, like that kind of hipster very. element, but in a way that's also kind of satirical. Yeah, they're not just yeah. hipsters hanging out. They're kind of a certain type of person. Yeah, right? very much so. And, and people you run into yeah. all of uh, all of the time at Whole Foods. A- at Whole Foods. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whole it's where we go, <laughs> guys. Yeah. What else? Has Trader Joe's. Come on, Trader Joe's. I also love an you ending can never that is. Trader um, Joe's. I walk down. Oh. <laughs> I love an ending. You know, and there's not, no spoilers, but I love an ending that is um, kind of cerebral but terrifying and it's so hard to pull off quiet endings that are actually scarier than loud endings and a real ending too Mm -hmm. it really wraps everything it it, it creates the whole movie it leaves you with what the move the point is um what was the one last year about the the woman uh, who kept trying to contact her dead son the one i like dark song dark song oh yeah that was very similar it went somewhere yeah and it's bold and i I still don't know how i feel about where it went but man i i think it's a fascinating movie that of all the movies i saw last year that's the one i'm most interested to see 
what the, that director's like trajectory will yeah. be because that's a really adult horror film. I'm kind of surprised that I've seen as many of the films as you're doing. I know you're doing. You're yeah. keeping up yeah. nicely. Yeah. You do all the you're festivals, though. I know, but it's not always seeing them all, and and I don't generally like to be on a jury because yeah. then I don't get to enjoy a lot of what's going on and to yeah. see the city. I, you know, part of traveling is to see the place Where as well at, yeah. as as the movies, but. Um, you know, I do try and seek it out, and I do always want to be growing. I still feel like, you know, uh, I didn't get my, I didn't start making a living writing uh, movies and television until I was 33. Yeah. And I still feel 33. I still feel like I've got something to prove that, yeah. you know, that, that I'm learning every time and that I'm not relying on any old tricks. What, what experience gives me, though, is the opportunity to communicate what we're going for with the cast and the crew and the other artists yeah. involved in that. But I'm always trying to find it too and new ways of finding it and new ways of thinking about it because the actual technical tools are constantly being updated yeah. and what you can do with them is great. Uh, but the same old, I don't want to do the same old stories using all these new tools. You yeah. Know? Yeah, one oh, yeah, one, yeah. one of the things that I, I'm hopeful for with horror is, um, I mean, you know, we we you referred to it a lot. Of, you know, horror is kind of like the stepchild that nobody wants to acknowledge. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's, it's like yeah. you know, but but right it's now, it's the gutter genre. Yeah, it is, and and I wonder, I wonder if you know, maybe it'll always be that way. But uh, you know, the fact that like Criterion is going to do Night of the Living Dead, the original Night of the Living Dead, the fact that Guillermo del Toro just won a Golden Globe yeah. and maybe an Oscar. Yeah, but, but, you know, but what like, about the fact that they call? Uh, uh, you know, get out best comedy, comedy at the Golden yeah. Ghost. Then they're right. called a so thriller. It is the thriller. HFPA. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it, it is the, so it, it you know, it, so there's, it continues. Yeah, though. it continues, the but I, I like to think there's hope. I hope get yeah. out. They haven't announced any of the Academy. They haven't. Stuff. No. Yeah. And it'll definitely get nomination. Yeah. I think yeah. it's unquestioned, but it will be interesting to see if they were ever used the word horror. Cause it's very, it would be pretty easy to not call that a horror film. Like yeah. in the same way, Silence of the Lambs wouldn't be called a horror film. And but yet both, there's nothing more horrific. Yeah. They both are. But, but I, do I want my horror to be made? mainstreamed you know yeah. i don't know yeah. that i want everybody to adopt it that everybody and their grandmother can watch these movies they together. never can yeah. though. they never will because they we're always going to provoke right and and horror is not supposed to be polite no horror it, you know, as you say it's, it's meant to provoke it's yeah it's yeah it is you know metal it's yeah. it, it is the music you want to play to annoy your parents yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know but it is <laughs> nice every once in a while where it breaks through to just be like oh yeah see that one you know well get that out one works. It, yeah. get out is respectable and yet it is still rebellious and, and ironically if he smart. had just made a drama with that same subtext and that's what his message even with trump and everything it wouldn't be it would just be on the nose and no one would hear it. He used horror to get across, and that's yeah. the genius yeah. of that film. It the metaphor that genre, yeah. 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 I mean, it's so Stepford good. Wives, but yeah. brought into a, a new realm. Yeah, and you know, Jordan Peele, he made his directing debut a masterpiece. Yeah, it's, yeah. So, you know, rare. it's, it's so rare. It's phenomenal. Yeah. The first time out. And so, now that said, he had made obviously so by having Key and Peele. That's such yeah. a great laboratory, probably. And I yeah. like Keanu a lot too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I still yeah. see Keanu. There was a lot of horror in that show like yeah, he comedy had a horror, lot like, of like testing ground so it's great that. i wasn't that, that aware yeah. of the tv show i had yeah. seen it a couple of times so i did not know of its horror bent and we I should didn't... send you a couple of the, the good horror the gremlins ones two oh, that one. Okay. i sent you that one yeah. you did yeah. that's just because it was a pitching, a joe yeah. Bond, yeah. Uh, joe but there's Dante. a little bit of a shining reference to continental breakfast that's my favorite they do um they had like a series i don't usually listen to ones where they played extras on the walking dead that were really good but but you know he it just goes to show you Nothing comes out totally left field, but the idea of somebody yeah. like that taking over even an idea like Twilight Zone, you go, okay, that could be interesting yeah. with enough freedom. Yeah, as long as it's not, you know. One in. of my favorite Key and Peele sketches. It was just them listening to dubstep, and it literally <laughs> yeah. they were packing. It was like Key P was moving and Peel was helping him move, and he was like, "You got to listen to this new music," and it was dubstep, and it turns so horrific. It's like is. Salad Days. It gets like Monty <laughs> Python Salad Days, where it just uh, goes completely yeah, off yeah. the yeah, rails. That's great stuff. Um, but just so smart because it's just such a simple setup of I'm moving. Yeah. Let's listen to this new type of music. And then it goes nuts. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's that's an important thing, too, about the world of horror is so many horror fans are only horror fans yeah, yeah, yeah. that they restrict themselves to it. And, and it's you you block out so much stuff that would 
enrich your horror experience yeah. if you knew about it. not just cinematically but uh, or in, in in books or television or, or art of any kind but just in life you yeah. know you spend so many movies now are inspired by other movies rather than by living a life right and horror movies are more more guilty of that than any other genre yeah. um, it's a self-feeding kind of thing the original movies were inspired by books or theater or life, um, then as as the genre, well, as as the format of filmmaking aged, you know, filmmakers started coming out of filmmaking, and then they're inspired by other films, and they're creating a new language, Alfred Hitchcock or whomever, yeah. and then television starts being it becomes a thing, and it was born out of movies and radio, and and those stories are being told, and suddenly it starts to be a snake eating its tail. Yeah. You know, the, it, it, you lose the reference to something outside the movie theater or outside your living room. And the the more you grow, the more you're hurt, the more you fall in love and have your heart broken, the more you lose people who are close to you, um, the deeper you get, the more you face trauma, and that's why horror is so potent when it works really well is because it pricks those sores, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I, I want that, you know, I, I want that feeling, you know, I, I'm not a cutter, but I'd love to get well, that Because you're pain. in the safe place to experience it. Exactly. You can just experience it for that amount of time and you can empathize and understand someone. And, exactly. And yeah. that's, that's why uh, the people I really admire in all the arts, but in, in film particularly, are the ones where you feel a life lived and not just a movie watched, you yeah. know, and, and, and that's what I try and do. You know, uh, riding the bullet was probably my least successful mm. movie commercially, but it's the one that came most from uh, a personal place, you know, there, a, a place of loss. I'd lost my mm. mother uh, not long after that. Uh, I'd lost my brother before that and my father. And, you know, it was, it's about personal loss. Mm. And the, the King story was something that inspired it, but it was... A 30 page short story turned into a, a feature film that mm. I, you know, King gave me a kick in the butt and, and I kind of hurt. You yeah. know? And, and, uh, and then the movie, of course, was a flop. And <laughs> so it's a, here, but you here's, made it. here's my raw emotion set forth for you. So kick you've me in never, the balls. Uh, you've yeah. never adapted your own books to a film, have you? I mean, Not yet. Are, okay. No. But is no. that something you have? You well, I did. Uh, Chocolate was based on a short story oh, okay. I'd written 20 years before. <laughs> right. So that was the only literary adaptation of yeah. my own work. Interesting. But my, my book, Salome, which is not a horror novel, yeah. but a. Hollywood desert noir murder mystery. That's something uh -huh. that uh, I'm just now starting to tinker with, uh, cool. turning that into a feature. Cool. I love noir, modern yeah, yeah, noir. Yeah, no, yeah. Neo noir is one of my favorite yeah. subjects. Yeah, yeah. yeah, love it. So much good stuff. That's okay. that's this is like everything I wanted it to be. Like <laughs> I, I love conversations about the genre that exceed my expectations. <laughs> well done, Mick. Well Sometimes done. it can be limited. Yeah, yeah. Well, done. well, having done it for thirty years, maybe you've got some <laughs> insights. Well, yeah. you have fulfilled Elric's expectations. Thank you. Yes. Well, that's yeah. one out yeah. of three. But, but yeah. Beck is wildly disappointed. She's just oh, raging in. inside. <laughs> yeah, I man. heard. I got Sleepwalkers talk. I'm in. Yeah. 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 And and hopefully you satisfied those that have missed you being on the air. Uh, yeah. Hopefully this will ah, uh, that'd be nice. uh, give them a little bit something before your show returns. So yeah. thank you so much for joining us, Thanks Mick. So it's much, always a Mick. pleasure. Great to be always here. Always to good to, to you. see you guys. You guys are my friends. And Absolutely. try to get, I'm going to pick a name out of the ether for your first show who I'd be interested. Go to New Zealand. Peter Jackson on horror, I bet would make a great interview. <laughs> I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> make Done. it happen. Pete, baby, I did meet him. He, he's he, a great guy. I'm he sure he screened, be fun, yeah. um, uh, which movie did Dead he Dead Alive? Screen? Yeah, he screened Dead Alive for us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I bet, just bet like three fun. people in a screening room. Yeah. I love in, it. In Hollywood. Yeah. I can see you and him sitting down. So let's I go. want I want Alex D. Iglesias, which I added uh, a couple I'd extra syllables, but yeah. Alex D. De la D. Iglesias. Oh, yeah, so that our wish list. Right. Get, get me that. Make, make it happen. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> Great. Looking forward to the return of postmortem. So uh, thank you, Megan. We'll Thanks. see you guys next week. Thank you.